This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Marlo Diane. Forbidden Dragon. Blogspot. Com. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter Thirteen. Dr. Seward's Diary. Continued. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff was afflicted or blessed with something of his own ubiquitous suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me, in a confidential, brother-professional way, when she had come out from the death chamber, She makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It's quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment. I noticed that Van Helsing never kept far away. This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. There were no relatives at hand, and as Arthur had to be back the next day to attend at his father's funeral, we were unable to notify anyone who should have been bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why, for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be quite aware of English legal requirements, and so might in ignorance make some unnecessary trouble. He answered me, I know, I know, you forget that I am a lawyer as well as a doctor, but this is not altogether for the law. You knew that when you avoided the coroner. I have more than him to avoid. There may be papers more, such as this. As he spoke, he took from his pocket-book the memorandum which had been in Lucy's breast, and which she had torn in her sleep. When you find anything of the solicitors for the late Mrs. Westerna, seal all her papers, and write him to-night. For me, I watch here in the room and in Miss Lucy's old room all night, and I myself search for what may be. It is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers. I went on with my part of the work, and in another half hour had found the name and address of Mrs. Westerna's solicitor and had written to him. All the poor lady's papers were in order. Explicit directions regarding the place of the burial were given. I had hardly sealed the letter when, to my surprise, Van Helsing walked into the room, saying, "'Can I help you, friend John? I am free, and if I may, my service is to you.' "'Have you got what you looked for?' I asked. To which he replied, "'I did not look for any specific thing. I only hoped to find, and find I have, all that there was.' Only some letters and a few memoranda and a diary new begun, but I have them here and we shall for the present say nothing of them. I shall see that poor lad tomorrow evening, and, with his sanction, I shall use some. When we had finished the work in hand, he said to me, And now, friend John, I think we may to bed. We want sleep, both you and I, and rest to recuperate. Tomorrow we shall have much to do, but for to-night there is no need of us, alas. Before turning in we went to look at poor Lucy. The undertaker had certainly done his work well, for the room was turned into a small chapelle adante. There was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers, and death was made as little repulsive as might be. The end of the winding sheet was laid over the face. When the professor bent over and turned it gently back, we both started at the beauty before us, the tall wax candle showing a sufficient light to note it well. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death, and the hours that had passed, instead of leaving traces of decays of facing fingers, had but restored the beauty of life, till positively I could not believe my eyes that I was looking at a corpse. The professor looked sternly grave. 
He had not loved her as I had, and there was no need for tears in his eyes. He said to me, Remain till I return, and left the room. He came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall, but which had not been opened, and placed the flowers amongst the others on and around the bed. Then he took from his neck, inside his collar, a little gold crucifix, and placed it over the mouth. He restored the sheet to its place, and we came away. I was undressing in my own room when, with a premonitory tap at the door, he entered, and at once began to speak. Tomorrow I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. Must we make an autopsy? I asked. Yes, and no. I want to operate, but not what you think. Let me tell you now, but not a word to another. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. Ah, you are a surgeon and so shocked. You whom I have seen with no tremble of hand or heart do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. Oh, but I must not forget, my dear friend John, that you loved her, and have not forgotten it, for it is I that shall operate, and you must not help. I would like to do it to-night, but for Arthur I must not. He will be free after his father's funeral tomorrow, and he will want to see her, to see it. Then, when she is coffined ready for the next day, you and I shall come when all asleep. We shall unscrew the coffin lid, and shall do our operation, and then replace all, so that none know, save we alone. But why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, why do it? Without such it is monstrous. For answer, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart, and I love you the more because it does so bleed. If I could, I would take on myself the burden that you do bear. But there are things that you know not, but that you shall know, and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now how many years, and yet did you ever know me to do any without good cause? I may err, I am but a man, but I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you sent for me when the great trouble came? Yes, were you not amazed, nay horrified, when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying, and snatched him away by all my strength? Yes, and yet you saw how she thanked me, with her so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too so weak, and she kissed my rough old hand and blessed me. Yes, and did you not hear me swear a promise to her, that so she closed her eyes grateful? Yes. Well, I have good reason now for all I want to do. You have for many years, trust me. You have believed me weeks past, when there be things so strange that you might have well doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend John, if you trust me not that I must think what I think, and that is not perhaps well, and if I work as work I shall, no matter trust or no trust, without my friend trust in me, I work with heavy heart, and feel oh so lonely, when I want all help and courage that may be. He paused a moment, and went on solemnly, Friend John, there are strange and terrible days before us, let us not be two, but one. That so we work to a good end, will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I held my door open as I went away, and watched him go to his room and close the door. As I stood without moving, I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage. She had her back to me, so did not see me, and go into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it unasked to those we love. Here was a poor girl putting aside the terrors which she naturally had of death, to go watch alone by the bier of the mistress whom she had loved, so that the poor clay might not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, 
for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, You need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Why not? I asked, for his solemnity of the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, he said sternly, it is too late, or too early. See? Here he held up the little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen? I asked in wonder, since you have it now. Because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and the living. Her punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus unknowing she only stole. Now we must wait. He went away on the word, leaving me with a new mystery to think of, a new puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came, Mr. Markand, of Holman, Sons, Markand, and Litterdale. He was a very genial and very appreciative of what we had done, and took off our hands all cares as to details. During lunch he told us that Mrs. Westenra had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that, with the exception of a certain entailed property of Lucy's father, which now, in default of direct issue, went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate, real and personal, was left absolutely to Arthur Holmwood. When he had told us so much, he went on. Frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition, and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter, either penniless or not so free as she should be to act, regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far that we almost came into collision, for she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we had then no alternative but to accept. We were right in principle." and ninety-nine times out of a hundred we should have proved, by the logic of events, the accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes, for by her predeceasing her daughter the later would have come into possession of the property, and, even if she had only survived her mother by five minutes, her property would— in case there were no will, and a will was a practical impossibility in this case, have been treated at her decease as under intestacy, in which case Lord Galdeming, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors, being remote, would not be likely to abandon their just rights, for sentimental reasons regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced." He was a good fellow, but his rejoicing at the one little part, in which he was so officially interested, of so great a tragedy, was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long, but said he would look in later in the day and see Lord Galdeming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected to arrive at five o'clock, so a little before that time we visited the great chamber. It was so in very truth, for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of his goods, and there was a mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at once. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangement to be adhered to, explaining that, as Lord Galdeming was coming very soon, it would be less harrowing to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity, and exerted himself to restore things to the condition in which we left them the night before, so that when Arthur came, such shocks to his feelings as we could avoid were saved. Poor fellow! He looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. 
He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father, and to lose him, and at such a time was a bitter blow to him. With me he was as warm as ever, and to Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing that there was some constraint with him. The professor noticed it too, and mentioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, so I felt he would like to be quite alone with her. But he took my arm, and led me in, saying huskily, "'You loved her too, old fellow. She told me all about it, and there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you have done for her. I can't think yet.' Here he suddenly broke down, and threw his arms round my shoulders, and laid his head on my breast, crying, "'Oh, Jack, Jack, what shall I do? The whole of life seems gone from me all at once, and there is nothing in the wide world for me to live for.' I comforted him as well as I could. In such cases men do not need much expression. A grip of the hand, the tightening of an arm over the shoulder, a sob in unison, are expressions of sympathy dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs died away, and then I said softly to him, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed, and I lifted the lawn from her face. God, how beautiful she was! Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat. And as for Arthur, he fell to trembling, and finally was shaken with doubt as with an ague. At last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jack, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so and went on to suggest, for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help, that it often happened that after death faces become softened and even resolved into their youthful beauty, that this was especially so when death had been preceded by any acute or prolonged suffering. I seemed to quite do away with any doubt, and after kneeling beside the couch for a while and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that this must be goodbye, as the coffin had to be prepared. So he went back and took her dead hand in his and kissed it, and bent over and kissed her forehead. He came away, fondly looking back over his shoulder at her as he came. I left him in the drawing-room, and told Van Helsing that he had said good-bye, so the later went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations and to screw up the coffin. When he came out of the room again, I told him of Arthur's question, and he replied, I am not surprised. Just now I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together, and I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things, Van Helsing had been silent all dinner time, but when we had lit our cigars, he said, Lord. But Arthur interrupted him. No, no, not that, for God's sake, not yet at any rate. Forgive me, sir. I did not mean to speak offensively. It is only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered very sweetly. I only use that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you Mr., and I have grown to love you. Yes, my dear boy, to love you as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. Call me what you will, he said. I hope I may always have the title of a friend, and let me say that I am at a loss for words to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear. He paused a moment and went on. I know that she understood your goodness even better than I do, and if I was rude or in any way wanting at the time you acted so, you remember. The professor nodded. You must forgive me. He answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for you to quite trust me then, for to trust such violence needs to understand, and I take it that you do not, that you cannot 
trust me now, for you do not yet understand, and there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, and must not yet understand, but the time will come when your trust shall be whole and complete in me, and when you shall understand as though the sunlight himself shone through. Then you shall bless me from the first to last for your own sake, and for the sake of others, and for her dear sake to whom I swore to protect. "'And indeed, indeed, sir,' said Arthur warmly, "'I shall in all ways trust you. "'I know and believe you have a very noble heart, "'and you are Jack's friend, and you were hers. "'You shall do what you like.' "'The professor cleared his throat a couple of times, "'as though about to speak, and finally said, "'May I ask you something now?' "'Certainly.' You know that Mrs. Westenra left you all her property. No, poor dear, I never thought of it. And as it is all yours, you have a right to deal with it as you will. I want you to give me the permission to read all Mrs. Lucy's papers and letters. Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. I have a motive of which, be sure, she would have approved. I have them all here. I took them before we knew that all was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them, no strange eye look through words into her soul. I shall keep them, if I may. Even you may not see them yet, but I shall keep you safe. No word shall be lost, and in good time I shall give them back to you. It is not a hard thing that I ask, but you will do it, will you not, for Lucy's sake? Arthur spoke out heartily, like his old self. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved. I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up as he said solemnly, And you are right. There will be pain for us all, but it will not be all pain, nor will this pain be the last. We, and you too, you most of all, dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we reach the sweet. But we must be brave of heart and unselfish, and do our duty, and all will be well. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room that night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin. Strown with the wild garlic flowers, which sent through the order of lily and rose a heavy, overpowering smell into the night. Mina Harker's Journal, 22 September. In the train to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between then? In Whitby, and all the world before me, Jonathan away, and no news of him. And now, married to Jonathan, Jonathan a solicitor, a partner, rich, master of his business, Mr. Hawkins, dead and buried, and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. Some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I am rusty in my shorthand. See what unexpected prosperity does for us. So it may be as well to freshen it up again, with an exercise, anyhow. The service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there. One or two old friends of his from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton the president of the Incorporated Law Society. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. Jonathan thought it would interest me to go into the row for a while, so we sat down. But there were very few people there, and it was sad looking and desolate, to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home. So we got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm, 
the way he used to in the old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper, for you can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit. But it was Jonathan, and he was my husband, and we didn't know anybody who saw us, and we didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl, in a big cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria, outside Galenio's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me, and he said under his breath, My God! I am always anxious about Jonathan, for I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again. So I turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out as, half in terror and half in amazement, he gazed at a tall, thin man with a beaky nose and black mustache and pointing beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, and so I had a good view of him. His face was not a good face. It was hard and cruel and sensual and big white teeth that looked all the whiter because his lips were so red, were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan kept staring at him, till I was afraid he would notice. I feared he might take it ill. He looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered, evidently thinking I knew as much about it as he did. Do you see who it is? No, dear, I said. I don't know him. Who is it? His answer seemed to shock and thrill me, for it was said as if he did not know that it was me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. It is the man himself. The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel and gave it to the lady, who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her, and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him and said, as if to himself, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so, oh, my God, my God, if only I knew, if only I knew. He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him any questions, so I remained silent. I drew away quietly, and he, holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further and then went in and sat for a while in the green park. It was a hot day for autumn, and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed, and he went quickly into his sleep with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him, so did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes he woke up, and said to me, quite cheerfully, Why, Mina, have I been asleep? Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come, and we'll have a cup of tea somewhere. He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger, as in his illness he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him, for fear I shall do more harm than good. But I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. 
The time is come, I fear, when I must open the parcel and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own dear sake. Later, a sad homecoming in every way. The house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us. Jonathan still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady. And now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Westenra died five days ago, and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words. Poor Mrs. Westenra, poor Lucy. Gone, gone never to return to us. And poor, poor Arthur, to have lost such a sweetness out of his life. God help us all to bear our troubles. Dr. Seward's Diary Continued 22. September. It is all over. Arthur has gone back to Ring and has taken Quincy Morris with him. What a fine fellow is Quincy. I believe in my heart of hearts that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of us, but he bore himself through it like a moral Viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, she will be a power in the world indeed. Van Helsing is lying down. Having a rest preparatory to his journey, he goes to Amsterdam tonight, but says he will return tomorrow night. That he only wants to make some arrangements, which can only be made personally. He is to stop with me then, if he can. He says he has work to do in London, which may take him some time. Poor old fellow, I fear that the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength. All the time of the burial he was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, we were standing besides Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation, where his blood had been transfused to his Lucy's veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying he felt since then as if they too had been really married, and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us said a word of the other two operations, and none of us ever shall. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station, and Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He has denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted that it was only a sense of humor asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed till he cried, and I had to draw down the blinds, lest any one should see us and misjudge. And then he cried, till he laughed again, and laughed and cried together, just as a woman does. I tried to be stern with him as one is to a woman under the circumstances, but it had no effect. Men and women are so different in manifestations of nervous strength or weakness. Then, when his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him why his mirth, and why at such a time. His reply was in a way characteristic of him, for it was logical and forceful and mysterious. He said, Ah! You don't comprehend, friend John. Do not think that I am not sad, though I laugh. See, I have cried even when the laugh did choke me. But no more think that I am sorry when I cry, for the laugh he come just the same. Keep it always with you, that laughter who knock at your door and say, May I come in? It is not true laughter. No, he is a king, and he come when and how he like. He asks no person, he choose no time of suitability. He say, I am here. Behold an example, I grieve my heart out, for that so young, sweet girl. I give my blood for her, though I am old and worn. I give my time, my skill, my sleep. 
I let my other sufferers want, that she may have it all. And yet I can laugh at her very grave, laugh when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop upon her coffin and say thud thud to my heart, till it send back the blood from my cheek. My heart bleed for that poor boy, that dear boy. So of an age of mine own boy had I been so blessed that he live, and with his hair and eyes the same. There, you know now why I love him so, and yet when he say things that touch my husband's heart to the quick, and make my father's heart yearn to him as to no other man, not even you, friend John, for we are more level in experiences than father and son. Yet even at such a moment, King Laugh, he come to me and shout and bellow in my ear, Here I am, here I am, till the blood come dance back and bring some of the sunshine that he carry with him to my cheek. O oh, friend John, it is a strange world, a sad world, a world full of miseries and woes and troubles. And yet when King Laugh come, he make them all dance to the tune he play. Bleeding hearts and dry bones of the churchyard and tears that burn as they fall, all dance together to the music that he make with his smileless mouth of him. And believe me, friend John, that he is good to come and kind. Ah, we men and women are like ropes drawn tight with strain that pull us different ways. Then tears come, and like the rain on the ropes, they brace us up, until perhaps the strain become too great, and we break. But King Laugh, he come like the sunshine, and he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labor, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea, but as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him, as he answered me, his face grew stern, and he said in quite a different tone, Oh, it was the grim irony of it all, this so lovely lady, garlanded with flowers, that looked so fair as life, till one by one we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where rest so many of her kin, lay there with the mother who loved her, and whom she loved, and that sacred bell going toll, 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 so sad and slow, and those holy men with the white garments of the angel pretending to read books, and yet all the time their eyes never on the page, and all of us with the bowed head, and for what? She is dead, so, is it not? Well, for the life of me, Professor, I said, I can't see anything to laugh at and all that. Why, your expression makes it a harder puzzle than before. But even if the burial service was comic, what about poor Art and his trouble? Why, his heart was simply breaking. Just so. Said he not that the transfusion of his blood to her veins had made her truly his bride? Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so. But there was a difficulty, friend John. If so that, then what about the others? Ho, ho. Then this so sweet maid is a polyandrist, and me, with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, though no wits, all gone, even I, who am faithful husband to his now no wife, am bigamist. I don't see where the joke comes in there, either, I said, and I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his hand on my arm and said, Friend John, forgive me if I pain. I showed not my feelings to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my heart, then when I want to laugh, if you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now, when King Laugh have packed up his crown and all that is to him, for he go far, far from me, and for a long, long time, maybe you would, perhaps, pity me the most of all.
I was touched by the tenderness of his tone and asked why. Because I know. And now we are all scattered, and for many a long day loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death house in a lonely churchyard, away from teeming London, where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill, and where wild flowers grow of their own accord. So I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or if I even open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes, for here at the end where the romance of my life is told, ere I go back to take up the thread of my life work, I say sadly and without hope, Fini. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September, A Hampstead Mystery The neighborhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as The Kensington Horror, or The Stabbing Woman, or The Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a bluefer lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed and on two occasions the children had not been found until early in the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighborhood that, as the first child missed gave his reason for being away that a bluefer lady had asked him to come for a walk, the others had picked up the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural as the favorite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes us that to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be the bluefer lady is supremely funny. Some of our characterists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque by comparing the reality in the picture. It is only in accordance with general principles of human nature that the bluefer lady should be the popular role at these alfresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend, and even imagine themselves to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question, for some of the children, indeed all who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seems such as might be made by a rat or a small dog, and although of not much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September, Extra Special the Hampstead Horror, Another Child Injured, The Bluefer Lady. We have just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hill side of Hampstead Heath, which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has the same tiny wound in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It, too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the bluefer lady. End of chapter 13 Recorded by Marlo Diane April 21st to 26, 2006 Piscid West, Prince Edward Island
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by A. R. Dobbs, San Francisco, Spring 2006. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 14 Mina Harker's Journal. 23 September. Jonathan is better after a bad night. I am so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for that keeps his mind off the terrible things, and oh, I am rejoiced that he is not now weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done, so I shall take his foreign journal and lock myself up in my room and read it. 24 September. I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. Poor dear. How he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination. I wonder if there is any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever and then write all those terrible things? Or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know, for I dare not open the subject to him. And yet, that man we saw yesterday, he seemed quite certain of him. Poor fellow! I suppose it was a funeral upset him and sent his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how on our wedding day he said, Unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, mad or sane. There seems to be through it all some thread of continuity. That fearful count was coming to London. If it should be, and he came to London, with its teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty, and if it come, we must not shrink from it. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes, if required. And if it be wanted then, perhaps, if I am ready, poor Jonathan may not be upset, for I can speak for him and never let him be troubled or worried with it at all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness, he may want to tell me of it all, and I can ask him questions and find out things and see how I may comfort him. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker 24 September Confidence Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing, in that I am so far friend as that I sent you sad news of Miss Lucy Westenra's death. By the kindness of Lord Godalming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you, which show how great friends you were and how you love her. Oh, Madam Mina, by that love I implore you, help me. It is for others good that I ask to redress great wrong and to lift much trouble and terrible troubles that may be more great than you can know. May it be that I see you? You can trust me. I am friend of Dr. John Seward and of Lord Godalming, that was Arthur of Miss Lucy. I must keep it private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you tell me I am privileged to come, and where and when. I implore your pardon, madam. I have read your letters to poor Lucy, and know how good you are and how your husband suffer. So I pray you, if it may be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Again your pardon, and forgive me. Van Helsing Telegram Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing 25 September Come today by quarter past ten train if you can catch it. Can see you any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker Mina Harker's Journal 25 September 
I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing, for somehow I expect that it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience. And as he attended poor dear Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me all about her. That is the reason of his coming. It is concerning Lucy and her sleepwalking, and not about Jonathan. Then I shall never know the real truth now. How silly I am! That awful journal gets hold of my imagination and tinges everything with something of its own color. Of course it is about Lucy. That habit came back to the poor dear, and that awful night on the cliff must have made her ill. I had almost forgotten in my own affairs how ill she was afterwards. She must have told him of her sleepwalking adventure on the cliff, and that I knew all about it, and now he wants me to tell him what I know, so that he may understand. I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westenra. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on poor dear Lucy. I hope, too, Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I have had so much trouble and anxiety of late that I feel I cannot bear more just at present. I suppose a cry does us all good at times, it clears the air as other rain does. Perhaps it was reading the journal yesterday that upset me, and then Jonathan went away this morning to stay away from me a whole day and night, the first time we have been parted since our marriage. I do hope the dear fellow will take care of himself, and that nothing will occur to upset him. It is two o'clock, and the doctor will be here soon now. I shall say nothing of Jonathan's journal unless he asks me. I am so glad I have typewritten out my own journal, so that in case he asks about Lucy I can hand it to him. It will save much questioning. Later. He has come and gone. Oh, what a strange meeting! And how it all makes my head whirl round! I feel like one in a dream. Can it be all possible? Or even a part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even a possibility. Poor, poor, dear Jonathan! How he must have suffered! Please the good God all this may not upset him again. I shall try to save him from it. But it may be even a consolation and a help to him, terrible though it be, and awful in its consequences, to know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, and that it is all true. It may be that it is the doubt which haunts him, and that when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming, may prove the truth, he will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man, as well as a clever one, if he is Arthur's friend and Dr. Seward's, and if they brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy. I feel from having seen him that he is good and kind and of a noble nature. When he comes tomorrow, I shall ask him about Jonathan. And then, please God, all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think I would like to practice interviewing. Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News told him that memory is everything in such work, that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterwards. Here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. It was half past two o'clock when the knock came. I took my courage, Adome, and waited. In a few minutes Mary opened the door and announced, Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me, a man of medium weight, strongly built, with his shoulders set back over a broad, deep chest and a neck well balanced on the trunk, as the head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes me at once as indicative of thought and power. The head is noble, well-sized, broad, and large behind the ears. The face, clean-shaven, shows a hard, square chin, a large, resolute, mobile mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight, but with quick, sensitive nostrils that seem to broaden as the big, bushy brows come down and the mouth tightens. The forehead is broad and fine, rising at first almost straight and then sloping back over two bumps or ridges wide apart such a forehead that the reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but falls naturally back and to the sides. Big dark blue eyes, 
were set widely apart, and are quick and tender, or stern, with the man's moods. He said to me, Mrs. Harker, is it not? I bowed assent. That was Miss Mina Murray? Again I assented. It is Mina Murray that I came to see, that was friend of that poor dear child Lucy Westenra. Madam Mina, it is on account of the dead that I come. Sir, I said, you could have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra. And I held out my hand. He took it and said tenderly, Oh, Madam Mina, I knew that the friend of that poor little girl must be good, but I had yet to learn. He finished his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about, so he at once began. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere, and there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. You need not look surprised, Madam Mina. It was begun after you had left, and was an imitation of you, and in that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleepwalking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you and ask you, out of your so much kindness, to tell me all of it that you can remember. I can tell you, I think, Dr. Van Helsing, all about it. Ah, then you have good memory for facts, for details? It is not always so with young ladies. No, doctor, but I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you, if you like. Oh, Madam Mina, I will be grateful. You will do me much favor. I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some taste of the original apple that remains still in our mouths. So I handed him the shorthand diary. He took it with a grateful bow and said, May I read it? If you wish. I answered as demurely as I could. He opened it and for an instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. Oh, you so clever woman, he said. I knew long that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness, but see, his wife have all the good things, and will you not so much honor me, and so help me, as to read it for me? Alas, I know not the shorthand. By this time my little joke was over, and I was almost ashamed, so I took the typewritten copy from my work basket and handed it to him. Forgive me, I said, I could not help it, but... I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and so that you might not have time to wait, not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious, I have written it out on the typewriter for you. He took it, and his eyes glistened. You are so good, he said, and may I read it now? I may want to ask you some things when I have read. By all means, I said. Read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions whilst we eat. He bowed, and settled himself in a chair with his back to the light, and became so absorbed in the papers, whilst I went to see after lunch chiefly in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face all ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. Oh, Madam Mina, he said, how can I say what I owe you? This paper is as sunshine. It opens the gate to me. I am dazed. I am dazzled with so much light. And yet, clouds roll in behind the light every time. But that you do not, cannot comprehend. Oh, but I am grateful to you, you so clever woman. Madam, he said this very solemnly. If ever Abraham Van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be pleasure and delight if I may serve you as a friend, as a friend. But all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darknesses in life, and there are lights. You are one of the lights. You will have a happy life and a good life, and your husband will be blessed in you. But, doctor, you praise me too much. You do not know me. Not know you, I, who am old, and who have studied all my life men and women. I, who have made my specialty the brain and all that belongs to him and all that follow from him. And I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out 
truth in every line. I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy, of your marriage and your trust, not know you. Oh, Madam Mina, good women tell all their lives, and by day and by hour and by minute, such things that angels can read. And we men who wish to know have in us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature, and you are noble too, for you trust. And trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband? Tell me of him. Is he quite well? Is all that fever gone? And is he strong and hearty? I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan, so I said, He was almost recovered, but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins' death. He interrupted, Oh, yes, I know, I know. I have read your last two letters. I went on. I suppose this upset him, for when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of shock. A shock? And after brain fever so soon, that is not good. What kind of shock was it? He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. And here the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush. The pity for Jonathan, the horror which he experienced, the whole fearful mystery of his diary, and the fear that has been brooding over me ever since all came in a tumult. I suppose I was hysterical, for I threw myself on my knees and held up my hands to him and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands and raised me up and made me sit on the sofa and sat by me. He held my hand in his and said to me with, oh, such infinite sweetness, my life is a barren and lonely one, so full of work that I have not had much time for friendships. But since I have been summoned to hear by my friend John Seward, I have known so many good people and seen such nobility that I feel more than ever, and it has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me, then, that I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope, hope not in what I am seeking of, but that there are good women still left to make life happy, good women whose lives and whose truths may make good lesson for the children that are to be. I am glad, glad that I may be of some use to you. For if your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you that I will gladly do all for him that I can, all to make his life strong and manly and your life a happy one. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale, and what he like not where he love is not to his good. Therefore, for his sake, you must eat and smile. You have told me about Lucy, and so now we shall not speak of it, lest it distress. I shall stay in Exeter tonight, for I want to think much over what you have told me, and when I have thought, I will ask you questions, if I may. And then, too, you will tell me of husband Jonathan's trouble, so far as you can, but not yet. You must eat now. Afterwards, you shall tell me all. After lunch, when we went back to the drawing room, he said to me, And now tell me all about him. When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a weak fool, and Jonathan a madman. That journal is all so strange. And I hesitated to go on, but he was so sweet and kind, and he had promised to help, and I trusted him. So I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or at my husband. I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me, and not think me foolish that I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner as well as his words when he said, Oh, my dear, if you only know how strange is the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. 
I have learned not to think little of any one's belief, no matter how strange it may be. I have tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane. Thank you. Thank you a thousand times. You have taken a weight off my mind. If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You will read it for yourself and judge. And then when I see you, perhaps you will be very kind and tell me what you think. I promise, he said as I gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, as soon as I can, come to see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here at half-past eleven, and you must come to lunch with us and see him then. You could catch the quick 334 train, which will leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains off-hand, but he does not know that I have made up all the trains to and from Exeter, so that I may help Jonathan in case he is in a hurry. So he took the papers with him and went away. And I sit here, thinking, thinking, I don't know what. Letter by hand, Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, 25 September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. You may sleep without doubt. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is a noble fellow, and let me tell you from experience of men, that one who would do as he did in going down that wall and to that room, I and going a second time, is not one to be injured in permanence by a shock. His brain and his heart are all right, this I swear, before I have even seen him, so be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I come to see you, for I have learned all at once so much that again I am dazzled, dazzled more than ever, and I must think. Yours the most faithful, Abraham Van Helsing. Letter, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing, 25 September, 6.30 p.m. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, a thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off my mind. And yet... If it be true, what terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing, if that man, that monster, be really in London. I fear to think. I have this moment, whilst writing, had a letter from Jonathan, saying that he leaves by the 6.25 tonight from Launston, and will be here at 10.18, so that I shall have no fear tonight. Will you, therefore, instead of lunching with us, please come to breakfast at eight o'clock, if this be not too early for you? You can get away, if you are in a hurry, by the 10.30 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 2.35. Do not answer this, as I shall take it that, if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 26 September I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped, she told me of Van Helsing's visit, and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she has been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent and in the dark and distrustful. But now that I know, I am not afraid, even of the Count. He has succeeded, after all, then, in his design in getting to London. And it was he I saw. He has got younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out, if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late and talked it over. Mina is dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder and turned my face round to the light and said, after a sharp scrutiny, But Madam Mina told me you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madam Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. 
I smiled and said, I was ill, I have had a shock, but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night. I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality, and I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do, and so had only to keep on working in what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed, as he said, So, you are a physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to you to breakfast, and, oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist, and that, let me tell you, is much in this age so skeptical and selfish. And you, sir, I have read all the letters to poor Miss Lucy, and some of them speak of you, so I know you since some days from the knowing of others. But I have seen your true self since last night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning it is to know. You can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on I may ask for more help, and of a different kind, but at first this will do. Look here, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said solemnly. Then I am with you heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you will not have time to read them but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you and read them in the train. After breakfast I saw him to the station. When we were parting, he said, Perhaps you will come to town if I send for you, and take Madame Mina, too. We shall both come, when you will, I said. I had got him the morning papers and the London papers of the previous night, and while we were talking at the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eyes suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them, the Westminster Gazette, I knew by the color, and he grew quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself, Mein God, mein God, so soon, so soon. I do not think he remembered me at the moment. Just then the whistle blew and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself, and he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, Love to Madame Mina! I shall write so soon as ever I can. Dr. Seward's Diary, 26 September Truly there is no such thing as finality. Not a week since I said fini, and yet, here I am starting fresh again, or rather going on with the record. Until this afternoon I had no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become, to all intents, as sane as he ever was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and he had just started in the spider line also, so he had not been of any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur, written on Sunday, and from it I gather that he is bearing up wonderfully well. Quincy Morris is with him, and that is of much help, for he himself is a bubbling well of good spirits. Quincy wrote me a line, too, and from him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy. So as to them, all my mind is at rest. As for myself, I was settling down to my work with the enthusiasm which I used to have for it, so that I might fairly have said that the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming cicatrized. Everything is, however, now reopened, and what is to be the end God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows too, but he will only let out enough at a time to whet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday and stayed there all night. Today he came back and almost bounded into the room at about half-past five o'clock and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? he asked as he stood back and folded his arms. 
I looked over the paper, for I really did not know what he meant, but he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me, until I reached a passage where it described small puncture wounds on their throats. An idea struck me, and I looked up. Well, he said, it's like poor Lucy's. And what do you make of it? Simply that there is some cause in common. Whatever it was that injured her has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for, after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing anxiety does help to restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never, even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy, had he looked more stern. Tell me, I said. I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think, and I have no data on which to found a conjecture. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of, not after all the hints given, not only by events, but by me? Of nervous prostration following a great loss or waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or wasted? I shook my head. He stepped over and sat down beside me, and went on, You are a clever man, friend John. You reason well, and your wit is bold, but you are too prejudiced. You do not let your eyes see, nor your ears hear, and that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. Do you not think that there are things which you cannot understand, and yet which are? That some people see things that others cannot? But these are things old and new which must not be contemplated by men's eyes because they know, or think they know, some things which other men have told them. Ah! It is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all, and if it explain not, then it says there is nothing to explain. But yet we see around us every day the growth of new beliefs which think themselves new, and which are yet but the old which pretend to be young, like the fine ladies at the opera. I suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference? No? Nor in materialization? No? Nor in astral bodies? No? Nor in the reading of thought? No? Nor in hypnotism? Yes, I said. Charcot has proved that pretty well. He smiled as he went on. Then... You are satisfied as to it, yes? And of course then you understand how it act, and how can follow the mind of the great Charcot, alas that he is no more, into the very soul of the patient that he influence? No. Then, friend John, am I to take it that you simply accept fact, that you are satisfied to let from premise to conclusion be a blank? No. Tell me, for I am a student of the brain, how you accept hypnotism and reject the thought reading. Let me tell you, my friend, that there are things done today in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very man who discovered electricity, and who would themselves not so long before been burned as wizards. There are always mysteries in life. Why was it that Methuselah lived nine hundred years old? and old par one hundred and sixty-nine, and yet that poor Lucy, with four men's blood in her poor veins, could not live even one day. For had she lived one more day, we could save her. Do you know all the mystery of life and death? Do you know the altogether of comparative anatomy, and can say wherefore the qualities of brutes are in some men, and not in others? Can you tell me why? When other spiders die small and soon, that one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old Spanish church, and grew and grew, till on descending he could drink the oil of all the church lamps? Can you tell me why in the pampas, aye, and elsewhere, there are bats that come out at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry their veins? How in some islands of the western seas, there are bats which hang on the trees all day, 
and those who have seen describe as like giant nuts or pods, and that when the sailors sleep on the deck, because that it is hot, flit down on them, and then, and then in the morning are found dead men white as even Miss Lucy was. Good God, Professor, I said, starting up, do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat? And that such a thing is here in London in the nineteenth century? He waved his hand for silence and went on. Can you tell me why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men, why the elephant goes on and on till he sees dynasties, and why the parrot never die only of bite of cat or dog or other complaint? Can you tell me why men believe in all ages and places that there are men and women who cannot die? We all know, because science has vouched for the fact, that there have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years, shut in one so small hole that only hold him since the youth of the world. Can you tell me how the Indian fakir can make himself to die and have been buried and his grave sealed and corn sowed on it and the corn reaped and be cut and sown and reaped and cut again? And then men come and take away the unbroken seal, and that there lie the Indian fakir, not dead, but that rise up and walk amongst them as before. Here I interrupted him. I was getting bewildered. He so crowded on my mind his list of nature's eccentricities and possible impossibilities that my imagination was getting fired. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to do in his study at Amsterdam. But he used to tell me the thing so that I could have the object of thought in mind all the time. But now I was without his help, yet I wanted to follow him. So I said, Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me the thesis so that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. At present I am only going in my mind from point to point as a madman, and not a sane one, follows an idea. I feel like a novice lumbering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to another in the mere blind effort to move on, without knowing where I am going. That is a good image, he said. Well, I shall tell you. My thesis is this. I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Let me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that faculty which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of the big truth, like a small rock does a railway truck. We get the small truth first, good. We keep him, and we value him. But all the same, we must not let him think himself all the truth in the universe. Then you want me not to let some previous conviction inure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson aright? Ah. You are my favorite pupil still. It is worth to teach you. Now that you are willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. You think, then, that those so small holes in the children's throats were made by the same that made the holes in Miss Lucy? I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, Then you are wrong. Oh, would it were so, but alas, no. It is worse, far, far worse. In God's name, Professor Helsing, what do you mean? I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair and placed his elbows on the table, covering his face with his hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. End of chapter 14 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 15 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued For a while sheer anger mastered me, 
It was as if he had, during her life, struck Lucy on the face. I smote the table hard and rose up as I said to him, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said. Madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Oh, my friend, why, think you, did I go so far around? Why take so long to tell so simple a thing? Was it because I hate you and have hated you all my life? Was it because I wished to give you pain? Was it that I wanted, now so late, revenge for that time when you saved my life, and from a fearful death? Ah, no. Forgive me, I said. He went on. My friend, it was because I wished to be gentle in the breaking to you, for I know you have loved that so sweet lady. But even yet I do not expect you to believe. It is so hard to accept at once any abstract truth that we may doubt such to be possible when we have always believed the no of it. It is more hard still to accept so sad a concrete truth and of such a one as Miss Lucy. Tonight I go to prove it. Dare you come with me? This staggered me. A man does not like to prove such a truth. Byron accepted from the category jealousy. And prove the very truth he most abhorred. He saw my hesitation and spoke. The logic is simple. No madman's logic this time, jumping from tussock to tussock in a misty bog. If it not be true, then proof will be relief. At worst it will not harm. If it be true, ah, there is the dread. Yet every dread should help my cause, for in it is some need of belief. Come, I tell you what I propose. First, that we go off now and see that child in the hospital. Dr. Vincent, of the North Hospital, where the papers say the child is, is a friend of mine, and I think of yours, since you were in class at Amsterdam. He will let two scientists see his case, if he will not let two friends. We shall tell him nothing, but only that we wish to learn. And then? And then? He took a key from his pocket and held it up. And then we spend the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies. This is the key that locked the tomb. I had it from the coffin man to give to Arthur. My heart sank within me, for I felt that there was some fearful ordeal before us. I could do nothing, however, so I plucked up what heart I could and said that we had better hasten, as the afternoon was passing. We found the child awake. It had had a sleep and taken some food, and altogether was going on well. Dr. Vincent took the bandage from its throat and showed us the punctures. There was no mistaking the similarity to those which had been on Lucy's throat. They were smaller, and the edges looked fresher, that was all. We asked Vincent to what he attributed them, and he replied that it must have been a bite of some animal, perhaps a rat, but for his own part he was inclined to think it was one of the bats, which are so numerous on the northern heights of London. Out of so many harmless ones, he said, there may be some wild specimen from the south of a more malignant species. Some sailor may have brought one home, and it managed to escape. Or even from the zoological gardens a young one may have got loose, or one be bred there from a vampire. These things do occur, you know. Only ten days ago a wolf got out and was, I believe, traced up in this direction. For a week after the children were playing nothing but Red Riding Hood on the heath, and in every alley in the place, until this bluefer lady scare came along. Since then it has been quite a gala time with them. Even this poor little mite, when he woke up today, asked the nurse if he might go away. When she asked him why he wanted to go, he said he wanted to play with the bluefer lady. I hope, said Van Helsing, that when you are sending the child home you will caution its parents to keep strict watch over it. 
these fancies to stray are most dangerous, and if the child were to remain out another night, it would probably be fatal. But in any case, I suppose you will not let it away for some days. Certainly not, not for a week at least, longer if the wound is not healed. Our visit to the hospital took more time than we had reckoned on, and the sun had dipped before we came out. When Van Helsing saw how dark it was, he said, There is not hurry. It is more late than I thought. Come, let us seek somewhere that we may eat, and then we shall go on our way. We dined at Jack Straw's castle, along with a little crowd of bicyclists and others who were genially noisy. About ten o'clock we started from the inn. It was then very dark, and the scattered lamps made the darkness greater when we were once outside their individual radius. The professor had evidently noted the road we were to go, for he went on unhesitatingly, but, as for me, I was in quite a mix-up as to locality. As we went further, we met fewer and fewer people, till at last we were somewhat surprised when we met even the patrol of horse police going their usual suburban round. At last we reached the wall of the churchyard, which we climbed over. With some little difficulty, for it was very dark, and the whole place seemed so strange to us, we found the Western Ra tomb. The professor took the key, opened the creaky door, and standing back, politely but quite unconsciously, motioned me to precede him. There was a delicious irony in the offer, in the courtliness of giving preference on such a ghastly occasion. My companion followed me quickly, and cautiously drew the door to, after carefully ascertaining that the lock was a falling and not a spring one. In the latter case we should have been in a bad plight. Then he fumbled in his bag, and took out a matchbox and a piece of candle, proceeded to make a light. The tomb in the daytime, and when wreathed with fresh flowers, had looked grim and gruesome enough, but now, some days afterwards, when the flowers hung lank and dead, their whites turning to rust, and their greens to browns, when the spider and the beetle had resumed their accustomed dominance, when the time-discoloured stone and dust-encrusted mortar and rusty, dank iron and tarnished brass and clouded silver plating gave back the feeble glimmer of a candle, the effect was more miserable and sordid than could have been imagined. It conveyed irresistibly the idea that life, animal life, was not the only thing which could pass away. Van Helsing went about his work systematically, holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates, and so holding it that the sperm dropped in white patches which congealed as they touched the metal. He made assurance of Lucy's coffin. Another search in his bag, and he took out a turn screw. "'What are you going to do?' I asked. "'To open the coffin, you shall yet be convinced.' Straightway he began taking out the screws, and finally lifted off the lid, showing the casing of lead beneath. The sight was almost too much for me. It seemed to be as much an affront to the dead as it would have been to have stripped off her clothing in her sleep whilst living. I actually took hold of his hand to stop him. He only said, "'You shall see,' and again fumbling in his bag took out a tiny fret saw. Striking the turnscrew through the lead with a swift downward stab, which made me wince, he made a small hole, which was, however, big enough to admit the point of the saw. I had expected a rush of gas from the weak old corpse. We doctors, who have had to study our dangers, have to become accustomed to such things, and I drew back towards the door. But the professor never stopped for a moment. He sawed down a couple of feet along one side of the lead coffin, and then across and down the other side. Taking the edge of the loose flange, he bent it back towards the foot of the coffin, and holding up the candle into the aperture, 
motioned me to look. I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. It was certainly a surprise to me and gave me a considerable shock, but Van Helsing was unmoved. He was now more sure than ever of his ground, and so emboldened to proceed in his work. "'Are you satisfied now, friend John?' he asked. I felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me as I answered him. I am satisfied that Lucy's body is not in that coffin, but that only proves one thing. And what is that, friend John? That it is not there. That is good logic, he said, so far as it goes. But how do you, how can you, account for it not being there? Perhaps a body snatcher, I suggested. Some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it. I felt that I was speaking folly, and yet it was the only real cause which I could suggest. The professor sighed. Ah, well, he said, we must have more proof. Come with me. He put on the coffin lid again, gathered up all his things and placed them in the bag, blew out the light and placed the candle also in the bag. We opened the door and went out. Behind us, he closed the door and locked it. He handed me the key, saying, Will you keep it? You had better be assured. I laughed. It was not a very cheerful laugh, I am bound to say, as I motioned him to keep it. A key is nothing, I said. There are many duplicates, and anyhow it is not difficult to pick a lock of this kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, whilst he would watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and I saw his dark figure move until the intervening headstones and trees hid it from my sight. It was a lonely vigil. Just after I had taken my place, I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one and two. I was chilled and unnerved, and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand, and with myself for coming. I was too cold and too sleepy to be keenly observant, and not sleepy enough to betray my trust. So altogether I had a dreary, miserable time. Suddenly, as I turned round, I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between two dark yew trees at the side of the churchyard farthest from the tomb. At the same time a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground, and hurriedly went towards it. Then I too moved, but I had to go round headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over graves. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off an early cock crew. A little ways off, beyond a line of scattered juniper trees which marked the pathway to the church, a white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb, the tomb itself was hidden by trees, and I could not see where the figure had disappeared. I heard the rustle of actual movement where I had first seen the white figure, and coming over found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me he held it out to me, and said, Are you satisfied now? No, I said, in a way that I felt was aggressive. Do you not see the child? Yes, it is a child. But who brought it here? And is it wounded? We shall see, said the professor, and with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleeping child. When we had got some little distance away, we went into a clump of trees and struck a match, and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time, said the professor, thankfully. We had now to decide what we were to do with the child, and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we should have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least we should have to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. 
So finally we decided that we would take it to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, would leave it where he could not fail to find it. We would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway, we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed his lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment, and then we went away silently. By good chance we got a cab near the Spaniards and drove to town. I cannot sleep, so I make this entry. But I must try to get a few hours sleep, as Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I go with him on another expedition. 27th of September It was two o'clock before we found a suitable opportunity for our attempt. The funeral held at noon was all completed, and the last stragglers of the mourners had taken themselves lazily away, when, looking carefully from behind a clump of alder trees, we saw the sexton lock the gate after him. We knew that we were safe till the morning, did we desire it, but the professor told me that we should not want more than an hour at most. Again I felt that horrid sense of the reality of things, in which any effort of imagination seemed out of place, and I realized distinctly the perils of the law which we were incurring in our unhallowed work. Besides, I felt it was all so useless, outrageous as it was to open a leaden coffin to see if a woman dead nearly a week were really dead, it now seemed the height of folly to open the tomb again when we knew, from the evidence of our own eyesight, that the coffin was empty. I shrugged my shoulders, however, and rested silent, for Van Helsing had a way of going on his own road, no matter who remonstrated. He took the key, opened the vault, and again courteously motioned me to proceed. The place was not so gruesome as last night, but oh, how unutterably mean-looking when the sunshine streamed in. Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin, and I followed. He bent over, and again forced back the leaden flange, and a shock of surprise and dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, seemingly just as we had seen her the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The lips were red, nay, redder than before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. "'Is this a juggle?' I said to him. "'Are you convinced now?' said the professor, in response. And as he spoke he put over his hand, and in a way that made me shudder, pulled back the dead lips and showed the white teeth. "'See,' he went on, "'they are even sharper than before. With this and this,' and he touched one of the canine teeth and that below it, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John? Once more argumentative hostility woke within me. I could not accept such an overwhelming idea as he suggested. So with an attempt to argue, of which I was even at the moment ashamed, I said, She may have been placed here since last night. Indeed? That is so. And by whom? I do not know. Someone has done it. And yet she has been dead one week. Most peoples in that time would not look so. I had no answer for this, so was silent. Van Helsing did not seem to notice my silence. At any rate he showed neither chagrin nor triumph. He was looking intently at the face of the dead woman, raising the eyelids and looking at the eyes, and once more opening the lips and examining the teeth. Then he turned to me and said, Here there is one thing which is different from all recorded. Here is some dual life that is not as the common. 
She was bitten by the vampire when she was in a trance, sleepwalking. Oh, you start. You do not know that, friend John, but you shall know it later. And in trance could he best come to take more blood. In trance she dies, and in trance she is undead too. So it is that she differ from all other. Usually when the undead sleep at home, as he spoke he made a comprehensive sweep of his arm to designate what to a vampire was home, their face show what they are. But this so sweet that was when she not undead, she go back to the nothings of the common dead. There is no malign there, see, and so it make hard that I must kill her in her sleep. This turned my blood cold, and it began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories. But if she were really dead, what was there of terror in the idea of killing her? He looked up at me, and evidently saw the change in my face, for he said almost joyously, "'Ah, you believe now!' I answered, "'Do not press me too hard all at once. I am willing to accept. How will you do this bloody work?' "'I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body.' It made me shudder to think of so mutilating the body of the woman whom I had loved. And yet the feeling was not so strong as I had expected. I was, in fact, beginning to shudder at the presence of this being, this undead as Van Helsing called it, and to loathe it. Is it possible that love is all subjective, or all objective? I waited a considerable time for Van Helsing to begin, but he stood as if wrapped in thought. Presently he closed the catch of his bag with a snap and said, I have been thinking and have made up my mind as to what is best. If I did simply follow my inclining, I would do now at this moment what is to be done. But there are other things to follow, and things that are a thousand times more difficult, in that them we do not know. This is simple, she have yet no life taken, though that is of time, and to act now would be to take danger from her for ever. But then we may have to want Arthur, and how shall we tell him of this? If you, who saw the wounds on Lucy's throat, and saw the wounds so similar on the child's at the hospital, if you, who saw the coffin empty last night, and full to-day, with a woman who have not change, only to be more rose and more beautiful in a whole week after she die. If you know of this, and know of the white figure last night that brought the child to the churchyard, and yet of your own senses you did not believe, how then can I expect Arthur, who know none of those things, to believe? He doubted me when I took him from her kiss when she was dying, I know he has forgiven me because in some mistaken idea I have done things that prevent him say good-bye as he ought. And he may think that in some more mistaken idea this woman was buried alive, and that in most mistake of all we have killed her. He will then argue back that it is we, mistaken ones, that have killed her by our own ideas, and so he will be much unhappy always. Yet he never can be sure and that is the worst of all. And he will sometimes think that she he loved was buried alive, and that will paint his dreams with horrors of what she must have suffered. And again he will think that we may be right, and that his so beloved was after all an undead. No, I told him once, and since then I learn much. Now since I know it is all true, a hundred thousand times more do I know that he must pass through the bitter waters to reach the sweet. He, poor fellow, must have one hour that will make the very face of heaven grow black to him. Then we can act for good all round and send him peace. My mind is made up. Let us go. You return home for tonight to your asylum, and see that all be well. As for me, I shall spend the night here, in this churchyard, in my own way. Tomorrow night you shall come to me to the Barclay Hotel at ten of the clock. I shall send for Arthur to come too, 
and also that so fine young man of America that gave his blood. Later we shall all have work to do. I come with you so far as Piccadilly, and there dine, for I must be back here before the sun set. So we locked the tomb and came away, and got over the wall of the churchyard, which was not much of a task, and drove back to Piccadilly. Note left by Van Helsing in his portmanteau, Berkeley Hotel, directed to John Seward, M.D., not delivered. 27th September Friend John, I write this in case anything should happen. I go alone to watch in that churchyard. It pleases me that the undead, Miss Lucy, shall not leave to-night so that on the morrow night she may be more eager. Therefore I shall fix some things she like not, garlic and a crucifix, and so seal up the door of the tomb. She is young as undead, and will heed. Moreover, these are only to prevent her coming out. They may not prevail on her wanting to get in, for then the undead is desperate, and must find the line of least resistance whatsoever it may be. I shall be at hand all the night from sunset till after sunrise, and if there be aught that may be learned, I shall learn it. For Miss Lucy, or from her, I have no fear, but that other, to whom is there that she is undead, he have not the power to seek her tomb and find shelter. He is cunning, as I know from Mr. Jonathan, and from the way that all along he have fooled us when he played with us for Miss Lucy's life, and we lost, and in many ways the undead are strong. He have always the strength in his hand of twenty men. Even we four who gave our strength to Miss Lucy, it also is all to him. Besides, he can summon his wolf, and I know not what. So if it be that he come hither on this night, he shall find me but none other shall, until it be too late. But it may be that he will not attempt the place. There is no reason why he should. His hunting ground is more full of game than the churchyard where the undead woman sleeps, and the one old man watch. Therefore I write this in case... Take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, and read them, and then find this great undead, and cut off his head, and burn his heart, or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. If it be so, farewell. Van Helsing Dr. Seward's Diary, 28th of September It is wonderful what a good night's sleep will do for one. Yesterday I was almost willing to accept Van Helsing's monstrous ideas, but now they seem to start out lurid before me, as outrage is on common sense. I have no doubt that he believes it all. I wonder if his mind can have become in any way unhinged. Surely there must be some rational explanation of all these mysterious things. Is it possible that the professor can have done it himself? He is so abnormally clever that if he went off his head he would carry out his intent with regard to some fixed idea in a wonderful way. I'm loath to think it, and indeed it would be almost as great a marvel as the other to find that Van Helsing was mad. But anyhow, I shall watch him carefully. I may get some light on the mystery. 29th of September Last night, at a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us all what he wanted us to do, but especially addressing himself to Arthur, as if all our wills were centred in his. He began by saying that he hoped we would all come with him too. For, he said, there is a grave duty to be done there. You were doubtless surprised at my letter, this query was directly addressed to Lord Godalming. I was. It rather upset me for a bit. There has been so much trouble around my house of late that I could do without any more. 
I have been curious, too, as to what you mean. Quincy and I talked it over, but the more we talked, the more puzzled we got, till now I can say for myself that I'm about up a tree as to any meaning about anything. Me too, said Quincy Morris, laconically. Oh, said the professor, then you are nearer the beginning, both of you, than friend John here, who has to go a long way back before he can ever get so far as to begin. It was evident that he recognized my return to my old doubting frame of mind, without my saying a word. Then, turning to the other two, he said with intense gravity, I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask, and when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then how much. Therefore may I ask that you promise me in the dark, so that afterwards, though you may be angry with me for a time, I must not disguise from myself the possibility that such may be, you shall not blame yourselves for anything. That's frank anyhow, broke in Quincy. I'll answer for the professor. I don't quite see his drift, but I swear he's honest, and that's good enough for me. I thank you, sir said Van Helsing proudly. I have done myself the honour of counting you one trusting friend, and such endorsement is dear to me. He held out a hand, which Quincy took. Then Arthur spoke out. Dr. Van Helsing, I don't quite like to buy a pig in a poke, as they say in Scotland, and if it be anything in which my honour as a gentleman, or my faith as a Christian, is concerned, I cannot make such a promise." If you can assure me that what you intend does not violate either of these two, then I give my consent at once, though for the life of me I cannot understand what you're driving at. I accept your limitation, said Van Helsing, and all I ask of you is that if you feel it necessary to condemn any act of mine, you will first consider it well, and be satisfied that it does not violate your reservations. Agreed said Arthur. That is only fair. And now that the poor parlours are over, may I ask what it is we are to do? I want you to come with me, and to come in secret, to the churchyard at Kingstead. Arthur's face fell, as he said in an amazed sort of way, Where poor Lucy is buried? The professor bowed. Arthur went on, And when there— to enter the tomb. Arthur stood up. Professor, are you in earnest, or is it some monstrous joke? Pardon me, I see that you are in earnest. He sat down again, but I could see that he sat firmly and proudly, as one who is on his dignity. There was silence until he asked again. And when in the tomb? To open the coffin. This is too much, he said, angrily rising again. I'm willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this, this desecration of the grave, of one who— He fairly choked with indignation. The professor looked pityingly at him. If I could spare you one pang, my dear friend, he said, God knows I would. But this night our feet must tread on thorny paths, or later— and forever the feet you love must walk in paths of flame. Arthur looked up with set white face and said, Take care, sir, take care. Would it not be well to hear what I have to say, said Van Helsing, and then you will at least know the limit of my purpose. Shall I go on? That's fair enough, broke in Morris. After a pause Van Helsing went on, evidently with an effort. Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Yes, then there can be no wrong to her. But if she is not dead... Arthur jumped to his feet. Good God, he cried, what do you mean? Has there been any mistake? Has she been buried alive? He groaned in anguish that not even hope could soften. I did not say she was alive, my child. I did not think it. 
I go no further than to say that she might be undead. Undead? Not alive? What do you mean? Is this all a nightmare, or what is it? There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. Believe me, we are now on the verge of one. But I have not done. May I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no! cried Arthur in a storm of passion. Not for the wide world will I consent to any mutilation of her dead body. Dr. Van Helsing, you try me too far. What have I done to you that you should torture me so? What did that poor sweet girl do that you should want to cast such dishonour on her grave? Are you mad that you speak such things? Or am I mad to listen to them? Don't dare think more of such a desecration. I shall not give my consent to anything you do. I have a duty to do in protecting her grave from outrage, and by God I shall do it. Van Helsing rose up from where he had all the time been seated, and said, gravely and sternly, My Lord Godalming, I, too, have a duty to do, a duty to others, a duty to you, a duty to the dead, and by God I shall do it. All I ask you now is that you come with me, that you look and listen, and if, when later I make the same request, you do not be more eager for its fulfilment even than I am, then I shall do my duty, whatever it may seem to me. And then, to follow your lordship's wishes, I shall hold myself at your disposal to render an account to you when and where you will. His voice broke a little, and he went on with a voice full of pity. But I beseech you, do not go forth in anger with me. In a long life of acts which were often not pleasant to do, and which sometimes did wring my heart, I have never had so heavy a task as now. Believe me, that if the time come for you to change your mind towards me, one look from you will wipe away all this so sad hour, for I would do what a man can to save you from sorrow. Just think, for why should I give myself so much labour and so much of sorrow? I have come here from my own land to do what I can of good, at the first to please my friend John, and then to help a sweet young lady whom too I come to love. For her, I am ashamed to say so much, but I say it in kindness, I gave what you gave, the blood of my veins. I gave it. I who was not like you her lover, but only her physician and her friend. I gave her my nights and days, before death, after death. And if my death can do her good even now, when she is the dead, undead, she shall have it freely. He said this with a very grave, sweet pride, and Arthur was much affected by it. He took the old man's hand and said in a broken voice, Oh, it is hard to think of it, and I cannot understand, but at least I shall go with you and wait. End of chapter 15「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to www.librivox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 16 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued it was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark with occasional gleams of moonlight between the dents of the heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. We all kept somehow close together with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. 
When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, for I feared the proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him, but he bore himself well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceeding was in some way a counteractant to his grief. The professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering first himself. The rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed to a coffin. Arthur stepped forward, hesitantly. Van Helsing said to me, You were with me here yesterday. Was the body of Miss Lucy in that coffin? It was. The professor turned to the rest, saying, You hear? And yet there is no one who does not believe with me. He took his screwdriver and again took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, very pale and silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. He evidently did not know there was a leaden coffin, or, at any rate, had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, the blood rushed to his face for an instant, but as quickly fell away again so that he remained of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For several minutes no one spoke a word. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, I answered for you. Your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask such a thing ordinarily. I wouldn't so dishonor you as to imply a doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond all honor or dishonor. Is this your doing? I swear to you, by all that I hold sacred, that I have not removed or touched her. What happened was this. Two nights ago my friend Seward and I came here, with good purpose, believe me. I opened that coffin, which was then sealed up, and we found it, as now, empty. We then waited, and saw something white come through the trees. The next day we came here in daytime, and she lay there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night we were just in time. One more so small child was missing, and we find it, thank God unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all night till the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was most probable that it was because I had lain over the clamps of those doors garlic which the undead cannot bear, and other things which they shun. Last night there was no exodus. So tonight, before sundown, I took away my garlic and other things. And so it is, we find this coffin empty. But bear with me. So far, there is much that is strange. Wait you with me outside, unseen and unheard, and things much stranger are yet to be. So, here he shut the dark slide of his lantern. Now to the outside. He opened the door, and we filed out, he coming last and locking the door behind him. Oh, but it seemed fresh and pure in the night air after the terror of that vault. How sweet it was to see the clouds race by and the passing gleams of the moonlight between the scudding crowds crossing and passing, like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air that had no taint of death and decay, how humanizing to see the red lighting of the sky beyond the hill, and to hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose and inner meaning of the mystery. I was myself tolerably patient and half inclined again to throw aside doubt and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic in the way of a man who accepts all things, and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery, with hazard of all he has at stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good-sized plug of tobacco and began to chew. As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a definite way. First, 
he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin, wafer-like biscuit, which was carefully rolled up in a white napkin. Next he took out a double handful of some whitish stuff, like dough or putty. He crumbled the wafer up fine and worked it into the mass between his hands. This he then took, and rolling it into thin strips, began to lay them into the crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled by this, and being close, asked him what it was that he was doing. Arthur and Quincy drew near also, as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb so that the undead may not enter. And is that stuff you have there going to do it? It is. What is that which you are using? This time the question came by Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered, The host. I brought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most skeptical of us, and we felt individually that in the presence of such earnest purpose as the professor's, a purpose which could thus use the, to him, most sacred of things, it was impossible to distrust. In respectful silence we took the places assigned to us close round the tomb, but hidden from sight of any one approaching. I pitied the others, especially Arthur. I had myself been apprenticed by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had up to an hour ago repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did tombs look so ghastly white. Never did cypress or yew or juniper seem the embodiment of funeral gloom. Never did tree or grass wave or rustle so ominously. Never did bow creak so mysteriously, and never did the far-away howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. There was a long spell of silence, big, aching, void, and then from the professor a keen he pointed, and far down the avenue of yews we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure, which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a startling prominence, a dark-haired woman dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause and a sharp little cry such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire in dreams. We were starting forward, but the professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind the yew tree, kept us back. And then, as we looked, the white figure moved forwards again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra! But yet how changed! The sweetness was turned to adamantine, heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing stepped out, and obedient to his gesture we all advanced too. The four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that lips were crimson with fresh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her long death robe. We shuddered with horror. I could see by the tremulous light that even Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed. Arthur was next to me, and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I called a thing that was before us Lucy, because it bore her shape, saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl, such as a cat gives when taken unawares. Then her eyes ranged over us. Lucy's eyes in form and color, but Lucy's eyes unclean and full of hellfire, instead of the pure gentle orbs we knew. At that moment, the remnant of my love passed into hate and loathing. Had she then to be killed, I could have done it with savage delight. As she looked, 
her eyes blazed with unholy light, and the face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh, God, how it made me shudder to see it! With a careless motion she flung to the ground, callous as a devil, the child that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry and lay there moaning. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur. When she advanced to him, with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back and hid his face in his hands. She still advanced, however, with a languorous, voluptuous grace, said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband, come. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, something of the tinkling of glass when struck, which rang through the brains even of us who heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his little golden crucifix. She recoiled from it and, with a suddenly distorted face full of rage, dashed past him as if to enter the tomb. When within a foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned, and her face was shown in a clear burst of moonlight and by the lamp, which had now no quiver from Van Helsing's nerves. Never did I see such baffled malice on a face, and never, I trust, shall such ever be seen again by my mortal eyes. The beautiful color became livid, the eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hellfire. The brows were wrinkled, as though the folds of flesh were the coils of Medusa's snakes, and the lovely, blood-stained mouth grew to an open square, as in the passion masks of the Greeks and Japanese. If ever a face meant death, if looks could kill, we saw it at that moment. And so for full half a minute, which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, oh, my friend, am I to proceed in my work? Do as you will, friend, do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more, and he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down. Coming close to the tomb, he began to remove from the chink some of the sacred emblem which he had placed there. We all looked on with horrified amazement as we saw, when he stood back, the woman, with a corporeal body as real at that moment as our own, pass through the interstice where scarce a knife-blade could have gone. We all felt a glad sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, Come now, my friends, we can do no more till tomorrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall all come before long after that. The friends of the dead will all be gone by two, and when the sexton locks the gate we shall remain. Then there is more to do but not like this of tonight. As for this little one, he is not much harmed, and by tomorrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as on the other night, and then to home. Coming close to Arthur, he said, My friend Arthur, you have had a sore trial, but after, when you look back, you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child. By this time tomorrow you will, please God, have passed them and have drunk of the sweet water, so do not mourn overmuch. Till then, I shall not ask you to forgive me. Arthur and Quincy came home with me, and we tried to cheer each other on the way. We had left behind the child in safety and were tired, so we all slept with more or less reality of sleep. 29. September. Night. A little before twelve o'clock, we three, Arthur, Quincy Morris and myself called for the professor. It was odd to notice that 
by common consent we had all put on black clothes. Of course Arthur wore black, for he was in deep mourning, but the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the graveyard by half-past one and strolled about, keeping out of official observation, so that when the gravediggers had completed their task and the sexton, under the belief that everyone had gone, had locked the gate, we had the place all to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little black bag, had with him a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was manifestly of fair weight. When we were alone, and had heard the last of the footsteps die out up the road, we silently, as if by ordered intention, followed the professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern, which he lit, and also two wax candles, which, when lighted, he stuck by melting their own ends on other coffins, so that they might give light sufficient to work by. When he again lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur trembling like an aspen, and saw that the corpse lay there in all its deadly beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could see even Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you shall see her as she was, and is. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained, voluptuous mouth, which made one shudder to see the whole carnal and unspirited appearance, seeming like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Van Helsing, with his usual methodicalness, began taking the various contents from his bag and placing them ready for use. First he took out a soldering iron, and some plumbing solder, and then a small oil lamp which gave out, when lit in the corner of the tomb, gas which burned at a fierce heat, with a blue flame, then his operating knives which he placed to hand, and last a round wooden stake, some two and a half or three inches thick and about three feet long. One end of it was hardened by charring in the fire and was sharpened to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking the lumps. To me, a doctor's preparations for work of any kind of stimulating and bracing, but the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quincy, was to cause them a sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage and remained silent and quiet. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the lore and experience of the ancients and of all those who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, there comes with the chance the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the preying of the undead become themselves undead and prey on their kind. And so the circle goes on, ever widening, like as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. Friend Arthur, if you had met that kiss which you know of before poor Lucy die, or again, last night when you opened your arms to her, you would, in time, when you had died, have become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe, and would for all time make many more of those undeads that so have filled us with horror. The career of this so unhappy dear lady is but just begun, those children whose blood she sucked are not as yet so much the worse, but if she lives on, undead, more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them they come to her, and so she draw their blood with that so wicked mouth. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of the throats disappear, and they go back to their play, unknowing ever 
of what has been, but of the most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free. Instead of working wickedness by night, and growing more debased in the assimilating of it by day, she shall take her place with the other angels, so that, my friend, it will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing. But is there none amongst us who has a better right? Will it be no joy to think of hereafter in the silence of the night when sleep is not? It was my hand that sent her to the stars. It was the hand of him that loved her best, the hand that of all she would herself have chosen had it been to her to choose. Tell me if there is one such amongst us. We all looked at Arthur. He saw, too, what we all did, the infinite kindness which suggested that his should be the hand which would restore Lucy to us as a holy and not unholy memory. He stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled and his face was pale as snow, My true friend, from the bottom of my, bro my broken heart I thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Van Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage, and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal. Be not deceived in that. But it will only be a short time, and you will then rejoice more than your pain was great. From this grim tomb you will emerge as though you tread on air, but you must not falter when once you have begun. Only think that we, your true friends, are round you, and that we pray for you all the time. Go on, said Arthur hoarsely. Tell me what I am to do. Take this stake in your left hand, ready to place the point over the heart, and then the hammer in your right. Then when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here the book, and the others shall follow. Strike in God's name, that so all may be well with the dead that we love, and that the undead pass away. Arthur took the stake and the hammer and when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trebled nor even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missal and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked, I could see its dint in the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the open red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp teeth champed together till the lips were cut, and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. He looked like a figure of Thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. His face was set, and high duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage, so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault, and then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and the teeth seemed champ, and the face to quiver. Finally, it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead, and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him and had he not been forced to his task by more than human considerations, he could never have gone through with it. For a few minutes we were so taken up with him that we did not look toward the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one to the other of us. We gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose, for he had been seated on the ground, 
and came and looked too, and then a glad, strange light broke over his face and dispelled altogether the gloom of horror that lay upon it. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded and grown to hate that the work of her destruction was yield as a privilege, the one best entitled to it, but Lucy, as we had seen her in life with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity. True that there were there, as we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste, but these were all dear to us, for they marked her truth to what we knew. One and all we felt that the holy calm that lay like sunshine over the wasted face and form was only an earthly token and symbol of the calm that was to reign for ever. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said to him, And now, Arthur, my friend, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he took the old man's hand in his, and raised it to his lips, pressed it, and said, Forgiven! God bless you! that you have given my dear one her soul again, and me peace. He put his hands on the professor's shoulders, and laying his head on his breast, cried for a while silently, whilst we stood unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, And now, my child, you may kiss her. Kiss her dead lips, if you will, as she would have you to, if for her to choose. For she is not a grinning devil now, not any more a foul thing for all eternity, no longer. She is the devil's undead, she is God's true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I saw the top off the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We soldered up the leaden coffin, screwed on the coffin lid, and gathered up our belongings, came away. When the professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside, the air was sweet. The sun shone and the birds sang and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. There was gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on one account, and we were glad, though it was with a tempered joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves. But there remains a greater task, to find out the author of all this our sorrow and to stamp him out. I have clues which we can follow, but it is a long task and a difficult one, and there is danger in it and pain. Shall you not all help me? We have learned to believe, all of us. Is it not so? And since so, do we not see our duty? Yes, and do we not promise to go on to the bitter end? Each in turn, we took his hand, and the promise was made. Then said the professor as we moved off, Two nights hence, you shall meet with me and dine together at seven of the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two that you know not as yet and I shall be ready to all our work show and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult you about, and you can help me. Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, but shall return tomorrow night. And then begins our great quest. But first I shall have much to say, so that you may know what to do and what to dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other anew. For there is a terrible task before us, and once our feet are on the ploughshare, we must not draw back.
End of chapter 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 17 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued When we arrived at the Berkeley Hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. I'm coming up by train. Jonathan at Whitby. Important news. Mina Harker. The professor was delighted. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina, he said. Pearl among women. She arrive, but I cannot stay. She must go to your house, friend John. You must meet her at the station. Telegraph her en route, so that she may be prepared. When the wire was dispatched, he had a cup of tea. Over it, he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker when abroad, and gave me a typewritten copy of it, as also of Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. Take these, he said, and study them well. When I have returned, you will be master of all the facts, and we can then better enter on our inquisition. Keep them safe, for there is in them much of treasure. You will need all your faith even you who have had such an experience as that of today. What is here told, he laid his hand heavily and gravely on the packet of papers as he spoke, may be the beginning of the end to you and me and many another, or it may sound the knell of the undead who walk the earth. Read all, I pray you, with the open mind, and if you can add in any way to the story here told, do so, for it is all important. You have kept a diary of all these so strange things, is it not so? Yes. Then we shall go through all these together when we meet. He then made ready for his departure, and shortly drove off to Liverpool Street. I took my way to Paddington, where I arrived about fifteen minutes before the train came in. The crowd melted away after the bustling fashion common to arrival platforms, and I was beginning to feel uneasy, lest I might miss my guest when a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl stepped up to me, and after a quick glance said, Dr. Seward, is it not? And you are Mrs. Harker, I answered at once, whereupon she held out her hand. I knew you from the description of poor dear Lucy, but she stopped suddenly, and a quick blush overspread her face. The blush that rose to my own cheeks somehow set us both at ease, for it was a tacit answer to her own. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we took the underground to Fenchurch Street, after I had sent a wire to my housekeeper to have a sitting room and a bedroom prepared at once for Mrs. Harker. In due time we arrived. She knew, of course, that the place was a lunatic asylum, but I could see that she was unable to repress a shudder when we entered. She told me that, if she might, she would come presently to my study, as she had much to say. So, here I am, finishing my entry in my phonograph diary, whilst I await her. As yet, I have not had the chance of looking at the papers which Van Helsing left with me, though they lie open before me. I must get her interested in something, so that I may have an opportunity of reading them. She does not know how precious time is, or what a task we have in hand. I must be careful not to frighten her. Here she is. Mina Harker's Journal 29th of September. After I had tidied myself, I went down to Dr. Seward's study. At the door I paused a moment, for I thought I heard him talking with someone. As, however, he had pressed me to be quick, I knocked at the door, and, on his calling out, Come in, I entered. To my intense surprise, there was no one with him. He was quite alone, and on the table opposite him was what I knew at once from the description to be a phonograph. I had never seen one, and was much interested. I hope I did not keep you waiting, I said, but I stayed at the door, as I heard you talking, and thought there was someone with you. Oh, he replied with a smile, I was only entering my diary. Your diary? I asked him in surprise. Yes, he answered, I keep it in this. As he spoke, he laid his hand on the phonograph. 
I felt quite excited over it, and blurted out, Why, this beats even shorthand. May I hear it say something? Certainly, he replied with alacrity, and stood up to put it in train for speaking. Then he paused, and a troubled look overspread his face. The fact is, he began awkwardly, I only keep my diary in it, and as it is entirely, almost entirely, about my cases, it may be awkward. That is, I mean, he stopped, and I tried to help him out of his embarrassment. You helped to attend dear Lucy at the end. Let me hear how she died. For all that I know of her, I shall be very grateful. She was very, very dear to me. To my surprise, he answered, with a horror-struck look in his face, Tell you of her death? Not for the wide world. Why not? I asked, for some grave, terrible feeling was coming over me. Again he paused, and I could see that he was trying to invent an excuse. At length, he stammered out, You see, I do not know how to pick out any particular part of the diary. Even while he was speaking, an idea dawned upon him, and he said, with an unconscious simplicity, in a quite different voice, and with the naivety of a child, That's quite true, upon my honour, honest Indian. I could not but smile, at which he grimaced. I gave myself away that time, he said. But do you know, that although I have kept the diary for months past, it never once struck me how I was going to find any particular part of it, in case I wanted to look it up. By this time, my mind was made up that the diary of a doctor who attended Lucy might have something to add to the sum of our knowledge of that terrible being, and I said boldly, Then, Dr. Seward, you had better let me copy it out for you on my typewriter. He grew to a positively deathly pallor, as he said, No! No, no, for all the world, I wouldn't let you know that terrible story. Then it was terrible, my intuition was right. For a moment I thought, and as my eyes ranged the room, unconsciously looking for something, or some opportunity to aid me, they lit on the great batch of typewriting on the table. His eyes caught the look in mine, and without his thinking, followed their direction. As he saw the parcel, he realised my meaning. You do not know me, I said. When you have read these papers, my own diary and my husband's also, which I have typed, you will know me better. I have not faltered in giving every thought of my own heart in this cause. But, of course, you do not know me yet, and I must not expect you to trust me so far. He is certainly a man of noble nature. Poor dear Lucy was right about him. He stood up and opened a large drawer in which were arranged, in order, a number of hollow cylinders of metal, covered with dark wax, and said, You are quite right. I did not trust you, because I did not know you. But I know you now, and let me say that I should have known you long ago. I know that Lucy told you of me. She told me of you, too. May I make the only atonement in my power? Take the cylinders, and hear them. The first half-dozen of them are personal to me and they will not horrify you. Then you will know me better. Dinner will by then be ready. In the meantime, I shall read over some of these documents, and shall be better able to understand certain things. He carried the phonograph himself up to my sitting-room, and adjusted it for me. Now I shall learn something pleasant, I am sure, for it will tell me the other side of a true love episode of which I know one side already. Dr. Seward's Diary, 29th of September I was so absorbed in that wonderful diary of Jonathan Harker, and that other of his wife, that I let the time run on without thinking. Mrs. Harker was not down when the maid came to announce dinner, so I said, She is possibly tired, let dinner wait an hour, and I went on with my work. I had just finished Mrs. Harker's diary when she came in. She looked sweetly pretty but very sad, and her eyes were flushed with crying. This somehow moved me much. Of late I have had cause for tears, God knows, but the relief of them was denied me, and now the sight of those sweet eyes, brightened by recent tears, went straight to my heart. So I said as gently as I could, I greatly fear I have distressed you. Oh no, not distressed me, she replied. 
but I have been more touched than I can say by your grief. That is a wonderful machine, but it is cruelly true. It told me, in its very tones, the anguish of your heart. It was like a soul crying out to Almighty God. No one must hear them spoken ever again. See, I have tried to be useful. I have copied out the words on my typewriter, and none of her need now hear your heartbeat as I did. No one need ever know, shall ever know, I said in a low voice. She laid her hand on mine, and said, very gravely, Ah, but they must. Must? But why? I asked. Because it is a part of the terrible story, a part of poor Lucy's death, and all that led to it. Because, in the struggle which we have before us, to rid the earth of this terrible monster, we must have all the knowledge and all the help which we can get. I think that the cylinders which you gave me contained more than you intended me to know, but I can see that there are, in your record, many lights to this dark mystery. You will let me help, will you not? I know all up to a certain point, and I see already, though your diary only took me to the 7th of September, how poor Lucy was beset, and how her terrible doom was being wrought out. Jonathan and I have been working day and night since Professor Van Helsing saw us. He has gone to Whitby to get more information, and he will be here tomorrow to help us. We need to have no secrets amongst us. Working together, and with absolute trust, we can surely be stronger than if some of us were in the dark. She looked at me so appealingly, and at the same time manifested such courage and resolution in her bearing, that I gave in at once to her wishes. You shall, I said, do as you like in the matter. God forgive me if I do wrong. There are terrible things yet to learn of. But, if you have so far travelled on the road to poor Lucy's death, you will not be content, I know, to remain in the dark. Nay, the end, the very end, may give you a gleam of peace. Come, there is dinner. We must keep one another strong for what is before us. We have a cruel and dreadful task. When you have eaten, you shall learn the rest, and I shall answer any questions you ask, if there be anything which you do not understand, though it was apparent to us who were present. Mina Harker's Journal, 29th of September. After dinner, I came with Dr. Seward to his study. He brought back the phonograph from my room, and I took a chair and arranged the phonograph so that I could touch it without getting up, and showed me how to stop it in case I should want to pause. Then he very thoughtfully took a chair with his back to me, so that I might be as free as possible, and began to read. I put the forked metal to my ears and listened. When the terrible story of Lucy's death and all that followed was done, I lay back in my chair, powerless. Fortunately, I am not of a fainting disposition. When Dr. Seward saw me, he jumped up with a horrified exclamation, and, hurriedly taking a case bottle from the cupboard, gave me some brandy, which, in a few minutes, somewhat restored me. My brain was all in a whirl, and only that there came through all the multitude of horrors the holy ray of light that my dear Lucy was at last at peace, I do not think that I could have borne it without making a scene. It is all so wild and mysterious and strange that if I had not known Jonathan's experience in Transylvania, I could not have believed. As it was, I didn't know what to believe, and so got out of my difficulty by attending to something else. I took the cover off my typewriter and said to Dr. Seward, let me write this all out now. We must be ready for Dr. Van Helsing when he comes. I have sent a telegram to Jonathan to come on here when he arrives in London from Whitby. In this matter, dates are everything, and I think that if we get all of our material ready and have every item put in chronological order, we shall have done much. You tell me that Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris are coming too. Let us be able to tell them when they come. He accordingly set the phonograph at a slow pace, and I began to typewrite from the beginning of the seventeenth cylinder. I used manifold, and so took three copies of the diary, just as I had done with the rest. 
It was late when I got through, but Dr. Seward went about his work of going his round of the patients. When he had finished, he came back and sat near me, reading, so that I did not feel too lonely whilst I worked. How good and thoughtful he is! The world seems full of good men, even if there are monsters in it. Before I left him, I remembered what Jonathan put in his diary of the professor's perturbation at reading something in an evening paper at the station at Exeter. So, seeing that Dr. Seward keeps his newspapers, I borrowed the files of the Westminster Gazette and the Pall Mall Gazette, and took them to my room. I remember how much the Daily Graph and the Whitby Gazette, of which I had made cuttings, had helped us to understand the terrible events at Whitby when Count Dracula landed. So I shall look through the evening papers since then, and perhaps I shall get some new light. I am not sleepy, and the work will help to keep me quiet. Dr. Seward's Diary 30th of September Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. He got his wife's wire just before starting. He is uncommonly clever, if one can judge from his face, and full of energy. If this journal be true, and judging by one's own wonderful experiences it must be, he is also a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. After reading his account of it, I was prepared to meet a good specimen of manhood, but hardly the quiet, business-like gentleman who came here today. Later, after lunch, Harker and his wife went back to their own room, and as I passed a while ago, I heard the click of the typewriter. They are hard at it. Mrs. Harker says that they are knitting together, in chronological order, every scrap of evidence they have. Harker has got the letters between the consignee of the boxes at Whitby and the carriers in London who took charge of them. He is now reading his wife's transcript of my diary. I wonder what they will make out of it. Here it is. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows that we had enough clues from the conduct of the patient Renfield. The bundle of letters relating to the purchase of the house were with the transcript. Oh, if we had only had them earlier, we might have saved poor Lucy. Stop. That way madness lies. Harker has gone back, and is again collecting material. He says that by dinner time they will be able to show a whole connected narrative. He thinks that in the meantime I should see Renfield, as, hitherto, he has been a sort of index to the coming and going of the Count. I hardly see this yet, but, when I get at the dates, I suppose I shall. What a good thing that Mrs. Harker put my cylinders into type. We never could have found the dates otherwise. I found Renfield, sitting placidly in his room, with his hands folded, smiling benignly. At the moment, he seemed as sane as any one I ever saw. I sat down and talked with him on a lot of subjects, all of which he treated naturally. He then, of his own accord, spoke of going home, a subject he has never mentioned to my knowledge during his sojourn here. In fact, he spoke quite confidently of getting his discharge at once. I believe that had I not had the chat with Harker, and read the letters and the dates of his outbursts, I should have been prepared to sign for him after a brief time of observation. As it is, I am darkly suspicious. All those outbreaks were in some way linked with the proximity of the Count. What then does this absolute content mean? Can it be that his instinct is satisfied as to the vampire's ultimate triumph? Stay. He is himself Zufagus and in his wild ravings outside the chapel door of the deserted house, he always spoke of master. This all seems confirmation of our idea. However, after a while I came away. My friend is just a little too sane at present to make it safe to probe him too deep with questions. He might begin to think, and then... So I came away. I mistrust these quiet moods of his so I have given the attendant a hint to look closely after him, and to have a straight waistcoat ready in case of need. Jonathan Harker's Journal 29th September, in train to London When I received Mr Billington's courteous message, 
that he would give me any information in his power, I thought it best to go down to Whitby and make, on the spot, such inquiries as I wanted. It was now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the Count's to its place in London. Later we may be able to deal with it. Billington Jr., a nice lad, met me at the station, and brought me to his father's house, where they had decided that I must spend the night. They are hospitable, with true Yorkshire hospitality, give a guest everything, and leave him to do as he likes. They all knew that I was busy, and that my stay was short, and Mr. Billington had ready, in his office, all the papers concerning the consignment of boxes. It gave me almost a turn to see again one of the letters which I had seen at the Count's table, before I knew of his diabolical plans. Everything had been carefully thought out, and done systematically, and with precision. He seems to have been prepared for every obstacle which might be placed by accident in the way of his intentions being carried out. To use an Americanism, he had taken no chances, and the absolute accuracy with which his instructions were fulfilled was simply the logical result of his care. I saw the invoice, and took note of it. Fifty cases of common earth to be used for experimental purposes. Also, the copy of the letter to Carter Paterson, and their reply. Of both these I got copies. This was all the information Mr. Billington could give me, so I went down to the port and saw the coast guards, the customs officers, and the harbour master who, kindly, put me in communication with the men who had actually received the boxes. Their tally was exact with the list, and they had nothing to add to the simple description, fifty cases of common earth, except that the boxes were main and mortal heavy, and that shifting them was dry work. One of them added that it was hard lines that there wasn't any gentleman such like as like yourself, squire, to show some sort of appreciation of their efforts in a liquid form. Another put in a rider that the first then generated was such that even the time which had elapsed had not completely allayed it. Needless to add, I took care before leaving to lift, forever and adequately, this source of reproach. 30th of September. The station master was good enough to give me a line to his old companion the station master at King's Cross, so that when I arrived there in the morning I was able to ask him about the arrival of the boxes. He, too, put me at once in communication with the proper officials, and I saw that their tally was correct with the original invoice. The opportunities of acquiring an abnormal first had been, here, limited. A noble use of them had, however, been made, and again I was compelled to deal with the result in ex post facto manner. From thence I went to Carter Paterson's central office, where I met with the utmost courtesy. They looked up the transaction in their day book and letter book, and at once telephoned to their King's Cross office for more details. By good fortune the men who did the teaming were waiting for work, and the official at once sent them over, sending also by one of them the way bill and all the papers connected with the delivery of the boxes at Carfax. Here again I found the tally agreeing exactly. The carrier's men were able to supplement the paucity of the written words with a few more details. These were, I shortly found, connected almost solely with the dusty nature of the job, and the consequent first engendered in the operators. On my affording an opportunity, through the medium of the currency of the realm, of the allaying at a later period this beneficial evil, one of the men remarked, That air house, governor, is the rummiest I ever was in. Blimey, but it ain't been touched since a hundred years. There was just that thick in the place that you might have slept on it without hurting of your bones. And the place was that neglected that you might have smelt old Jerusalem in it. But the old chapel, that took the sight that did. Me and my mate, we thought we wouldn't never get out quick enough. Lor, I wouldn't take less nor a quid a moment to stay there after dark. Having been in the house, I could well believe him. But if he knew what I know, he would, I think, have raised his terms. 
Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all those boxes which arrived at Whitby from Varna in the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at Carfax. There should be fifty of them there, unless any have since been removed, as from Dr. Seward's diary I fear. Later, Mina and I have worked all day, and we have put all the papers into order. Mina Harker's Journal 30th of September I am so glad that I hardly know how to contain myself. It is, I suppose, the reaction from the haunting fear which I have had, that this terrible affair and the reopening of his old wound might act detrimentally on Jonathan. I saw him leave for Whitby with as brave a face as could, but I was sick with apprehension. The effort has, however, done him good. He was never so resolute, never so strong, never so full of volcanic energy as at present. It is just as that good dear Professor Van Helsing said, he is true grit, and he improves under strain that would kill a weaker nature. He came back full of life, and hope, and determination. We have got everything in order for tonight. I feel myself quite wild with excitement. I suppose one ought to pity anything so hunted as the Count. That is just it. This thing is not human, not even a beast. To read Dr. Seward's diary of poor Lucy's death, and what followed, is enough to dry up the springs of pity in one's heart. Later. Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris arrived earlier than we expected. Dr. Seward was out on business, and had taken Jonathan with him, so I had to see them. It was to me a painful meeting, for it brought back all poor dear Lucy's hopes of only a few months ago. Of course, they had heard Lucy speak of me, and it seemed that Dr. Van Helsing, too, had been quite blowing my trumpet, as Mr. Morris expressed it. Poor fellows, neither of them is aware that I know all about the proposals they made to Lucy. They did not quite know what to say or do, as they were ignorant of the amount of my knowledge so they had to keep on neutral subjects. However, I thought the matter over, and came to the conclusion that the best thing I could do would be to post them on affairs right up to date. I knew from Dr. Seward's diary that they had been at Lucy's death, her real death, and that I need not fear to betray any secret before the time. So I told them, as well as I could, that I had read all the papers and diaries, and that my husband and I, having typewritten them, had just finished putting them into order. I gave them each a copy to read in the library. When Lord Godalming got it and turned it over, it does make a pretty good pile. He said, Did you write all this, Mrs. Harker? I nodded, and he went on. I don't quite see the drift of it, but you people are all so good and kind, and have been working so earnestly and so energetically, that all I can do is to accept your ideas blindfold and try to help you. I have had one lesson already in accepting facts that should make a man humble to the last hour of his life. Besides, I know you loved my Lucy." Here he turned away and covered his face with his hands. I could hear the tears in his voice. Mr. Morris, with instinctive delicacy, just laid a hand for a moment on his shoulder, and then walked quietly out of the room. I suppose there is something in a woman's nature that makes a man free to break down before her and express his feelings on the tender or emotional side without feeling it derogatory to his manhood. For when Lord Godalming found himself alone with me, he sat down on the sofa and gave way utterly and openly. I sat down beside him and took his hand. I hope he didn't think it forward of me, and that if he ever thinks of it afterwards, he will never have such a thought. There I wrong him. I know he never will. He is too true a gentleman. I said to him, for I could see that his heart was breaking, I loved dear Lucy, and I know what she was to you, and what you were to her. She and I were like sisters, and now she is gone. Will you not let me be like a sister to you in your trouble? I know what sorrows you have had, though I cannot measure the depth of them. If sympathy and pity can help in your affliction, won't you let me be of some little service, for Lucy's sake?" In an instant the poor dear fellow was overwhelmed with grief. 
it seemed to me that all that he had of late been suffering in silence found a vent at once. He grew quite hysterical, and, raising his open hands, beat his palms together in a perfect agony of grief. He stood up, and then sat down again, and the tears rained down his cheeks. I felt an infinite pity for him, and opened my arms unthinkingly. With a sob, he laid his head on my shoulder, and cried like a weary child, whilst he shook with emotion. We women have something of the mother in us that makes us rise above smaller matters when the mother spirit is invoked. I felt this big sorrowing man's head resting on me, as though it were that of a baby that some day may lie on my bosom, and I stroked his hair as though he were my own child. I never thought at the time how strange it all was. After a little bit his sobs ceased, and he raised himself with an apology, though he made no disguise of his emotion. He told me that for days and nights past, weary days and sleepless nights, he had been unable to speak with any one, as a man must speak in his time of sorrow. There was no woman whose sympathy could be given to him, or with whom, owing to the terrible circumstances with which his sorrow was surrounded, he could speak freely. I know now how I suffered, he said, as he dried his eyes, but I do not know even yet, and none of us can ever know, how much your sweet sympathy has been to me today. I shall know better in time, and believe me that though I am not ungrateful now, my gratitude will grow with my understanding. You will let me be like a brother, will you not, for all our lives, for dear Lucy's sake. For dear Lucy's sake, I said, as we clasped hands. Aye, and for your own sake, he added, for, if a man's esteem and gratitude are ever worth the winning, you have won mine today. If ever the future should bring to you a time when you need a man's help, believe me, you will not call in vain. God grant that no such time may ever come to you to break the sunshine of your life, but if it should ever come, promise me that you will let me know. He was so earnest, and his sorrow was so fresh, that I felt it would comfort him. So I said, I promise. As I came along the corridor, I saw Mr. Morris looking out of a window. He turned as he heard my footsteps. How is art? he said. Then, noticing my red eyes, he went on. Ah, I see you have been comforting him. Poor old fellow, he needs it. No one but a woman can help a man when he is in trouble of the heart, and he had no one to comfort him. He bore his own trouble so bravely that my heart bled for him. I saw the manuscript in his hand, and I knew that when he read it he would realise how much I knew. So I said to him, I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend, and will you come to me for comfort if you need it? You will know later why I speak. He saw that I was in earnest, and stooping, took my hand, and, raising it to his lips, kissed it. It seemed but poor comfort to so brave and unselfish a soul, and, impulsively, I bent over and kissed him. The tears rose in his eyes, and there was a momentary choking in his throat. He said, quite calmly, Little girl, you will never forget that true-hearted kindness so long as ever you live. Then he went into the study to his friend. Little girl, the very words he had used to Lucy, and oh, but he proved himself a friend. The End of Chapter 17 This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Richards from futilityradio.com Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 18 Dr. Seward's Diary, 30th September I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived but had already studied the transcript of the various diaries and letters which Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea, and I can honestly say that, for the first time since I've lived in it, this old house seemed like home. 
When we had finished tea, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favour? I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty that I could not refuse her, and there was no possible reason why I should, so I took her with me. When I went into the room, I told the man that a lady would like to see him, to which he simply answered, Why? She is going through the house and wants to see everyone in it, I said. Oh, very well, he said. Let her come in by all means, but just wait a minute till I tidy up the place. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all of the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared, or was jealous of, some interference. When he'd got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, Let the lady come in, and sat down on the edge of his bed with his head down, but with his eyelids raised so that he could see her as she entered. For a moment I thought he might have some homicidal intent. I remembered how quiet he had been just before he attacked me in my own study, and I took care to stand where I could seize him at once if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness, which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is one of the qualities mad people most respect. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. "'Good evening, Mr. Renfield,' said she. "'You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you.' He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave away to one of wonder, which merged in doubt. Then, to my intense astonishment, he said, "'You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? "'You can't be, you know, for she's dead.' Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, "'Oh, no, I have a husband of my own, "'to whom I was married before I ever saw Dr. Seward, "'or he me. I am Mrs. Harker. "'Then what are you doing here? "'My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. "'Then don't stay. But why not?' I thought that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker any more than it was to me, so I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? His reply was simply contemptuous, given in a pause in which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question! I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield, said Mrs. Harker, at once championing me. He replied to her with as much courtesy and respect as he had shown contempt to me. You will of course understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is so loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of his inmates lean towards the errors of non-causa and ignoratio elench. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I had ever met with, talking elemental philosophy, and with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wonder if it was Mrs. Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory. If this new phase was spontaneous or in any way due to her unconscious influence, she must have some rare gift or power. We continued to talk for some time, and seeing that he was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly as she began to lead him to his favourite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why, I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that by consuming a multitude of living things, no matter how low in the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times I held the belief so strongly that I had actually tried to take a human life. The doctor here will bear me out that on one occasion I tried to kill him for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life. Though, indeed, the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarised the truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, doctor? I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew what to either think or say. It was hard to imagine that I had seen him eat up his spiders and flies not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, and I told Mrs. Harker that it was time to leave. She came at once. 
after saying pleasantly to Mr. Renfield, "'Good-bye, and I hope that I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself.' To which, to my astonishment, he replied, "'Good-bye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you.' When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Art seemed more cheerful than he has been since Lucy first took ill, and Quincy is more like his own bright self than he has been for many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with the eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once and rushed up to me, saying, "'Ah, friends, John, how goes all?' "'Well, so, I have been busy, for I come here to stay, if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell.' "'Madam Mina is with you?' "'Yes. And her so fine husband?' "'And Arthur and my friend Quincy, they are with you too? "'Good.' "'As I drove to the house, I told him of what had passed, "'and of how my own diary had come to be of some use "'through Mrs. Harker's suggestion, "'at which the professor interrupted me. "'Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina! "'She has a man's brain, "'a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, "'and a woman's heart. "'The good God fashioned her for a purpose, believe me, "'when he made that so good combination. "'Friend John,' Up to now fortune has made that woman of help to us. After tonight she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. It is not good that she run a risk so great. We men are determined, nay, are we not pledged to destroy this monster? But it is no part for a woman. Even if she be not harmed, her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer, both in walking from her nerves and in sleep from her dreams. And besides, she is young woman and not so long married." There may be other things to think of some time, if not now. You tell me she has wrote all, then she must consult with us, but tomorrow we say good-bye to this work, and we go alone. I agreed heartily with him, and then I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed, and a great concern seemed to come on him. Oh, that we had known it before, he said, for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. However, the milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that, but go on our way to the end. Then he fell into silence that lasted till we entered my own gateway. Before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs. Harker, I am told, Madam Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all things that have been up to this moment. Not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, but up to this morning. But why not up till now? We have seen hitherto how good light all of the little things have made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told is the worst for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking a paper from a pocket, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this, and tell me if it must go in? It is my record of today. I too have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial, but there is little in this, except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely, and handed it back, saying, it need not go in if you do not wish it, but I pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you the more, and all us, your friends, more honour you, as well as more esteem and love. She took it back with another blush and a bright smile. And so now, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner and before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. The rest of us have already read everything, so when we meet in the study we shall all be informed as to facts, and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th September When we met in Dr. Seawood's study two hours after dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of board or committee. Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seawood motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right, and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next to the professor, and Dr. Seward in the centre. The professor said, I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers. We all expressed assent, and he went on. Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertained for me, so we can then discuss how we shall act, and can take our measure according. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. I admit that at the first 
I was sceptic. Were it not that through long years I have trained myself to keep an open mind, I could not have believed until such time as that fact thunder on my ear. See, see, I prove, I prove. Alas, had I known at first what now I know, nay, had I even guessed at him, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who did love her. But that is gone, and we must so work that other poor souls perish not whilst we can save. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting once. He is only stronger, and being stronger have yet more power to work evil. This vampire which is amongst us of himself is so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal, for his cunning be the growth of ages, and have still the aids of necromancy, which is, as his etymology imply, the divination of the dead, and all the dead that he can come nigh to are for him at command. He is brute, and more than brute. He is devil in callous, and the heart of him is not. He can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the rat and the owl, and the bat, the moth, and the fox, and the wolf. And he can grow and become small, and he can at times vanish and come unknown. How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his where, and having found it, how can we destroy? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake, and there may be consequence to make the brave shudder. For if we fail in this, our fight, he must surely win, and then where end we? Life is nothings, I heed him not. But to fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him, that we henceforward become foul things of the night like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and the souls of those we love best. To us for ever are the gates of heaven shut, for who shall open them to us again? We go on for all time, abhorred by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the side of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case we must shrink. For me, I say no, but then I am old, and life, with his sunshine, his fair places, his songs of birds, his music and his love, lie far behind. You others are young, some have seen sorrow, but there are fair days yet in store. What say you? Whilst he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared, oh so much, that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him when I saw his hand stretch out. But it was life to me to feel its touch, so strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. It does not even need a woman's love to hear its music. When the professor had done speaking, my husband looked into my eyes, and I in his. There was no need for speaking between us. I answer for Mina and myself, he said. Count me in, Professor, said Mr. Quincy Morris, laconically as usual. I am with you, said Lord Godalming, for Lucy's sake, if for no other reason. Dr. Seward simply nodded. The Professor stood up and, after laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand on either side. I took his right hand and Lord Godalming his left. Jonathan held my right with his left and stretched across to Mr. Morris. So as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. I felt my heart icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We resumed our places, and Dr. Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely and in as business-like a way as any other transaction of life. Well, you know what we have to contend against, but we too are not without strength. We have on our side power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have sources of science, we are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered, and we are free to use them. We have self-devotion in a cause, and an end to achieve, which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now, let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict, and how the individual cannot. In fine, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and this one in particular. All we have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much, when the matter is one of life and death, nay of more than life and death. Yet must we be satisfied, in the first place because we have to be, no other means is at our control. 
and secondly, because, after all these things, tradition and superstition are everything. Does not the belief in vampires rest for others, though not, alas, for us on them? A year ago, which of us would have received such a possibility in the midst of our scientific, sceptical, matter-of-fact 19th century? We even scouted a belief that we saw justified under our very eyes. Take it, then, that the vampire and the belief in his limitations and his cure rest for the moment on some base. For, let me tell you, he is known everywhere that men have been. In old Greece, in old Rome, he flourished in Germany all over, in France, in India, even in the Germanese and in China, so far from us in all ways. There even is he, and the peoples for him at this day. He have followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, the devil-begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, the Magyar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon, and let me tell you that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen in our own so unhappy experience. The vampire live on, and cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Even more, we have seen amongst us that he can grow younger, that his vital faculties grow strenuous, and seem as though they refresh themselves when his special pabulum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did never see him eat. Never. He throws no shadow. He make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observe. He has the strength of many of his hand. Witness again Jonathan when he shut the door against the wolves, and when he help him from the diligence too. He can transform himself to wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby, when he tear open the dog. He can be as a bat, as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby, and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house, and as my friend Quincy saw him in the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create, that noble ship's captain proved him of this, but, from what we know, the distance he can make this mist is limited, and it can only be round himself. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle of Dracula. He becomes so small, we ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hairbreadth space at the tomb door. He can, when once he find his way, come out from anything or into anything, no matter how close it be bound, or even fused up with fire, solder you call it. He can see in the dark, no small power this, in a world which is one half shut from the light. Ah, but hear me through. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. Nay, he is even more prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some nature's laws. Why? We know not. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be some one of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, as does that of all evil things, at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom. If he be not at the place whither he is bound, he can only change himself at noon, or exact sunrise or sunset. These things we are told, and in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as he will within his limit, when he have his earth home, his coffin home, his hell home, the place unhallowed, as we saw when he went to the grave of the suicide at Whitby, still, at other time, he can only change when the time come. It is said, too, that he can only pass running water at the slack or the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of, and as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now when we resolve. To them he is nothing, but in their presence he take his place far off and silent with respect. There are others, too, which I shall tell you of, lest in our seeking we may need them. The branch of wild rose on his coffin keep him that he may not move from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him so that he be true dead. And as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen it with our own eyes. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him, if we obey what we know. But he is clever. I have asked my friend Arminius, of Budapest University, to make his record, and from all the means that are, 
he tell me of what he has been. He must indeed have been that Virvode Dracula, who won his name against the Turk over the great river on the very frontier of Turkey land. If it be so, then was he no common man, for in that time and for centuries after he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain and that iron resolution went with him to his grave, and are even now arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race, though now and again were scions who were held by their covals to have had dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Scholomans, amongst the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar as his due. In the records are such words as Strogokica, Witch, Ordog, and Pokol, Satan and Hell, and in one manuscript this very Dracula is spoken of as Vampire, which we all understand too well. There have been from the loins of this very one great man and good women, and their graves make sacred the earth, where alone this foulness can dwell. For it is not the least of its terrors that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good. In soil barren of holy memories it cannot rest. Whilst they were talking, Mr Morris was looking steadily at the window, and he now got up quietly and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and then the professor went on. And now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. It seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain in the house beyond that wall where we look today, or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must trace... Here, we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside the house came the sound of a pistol shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet, which, ricocheting from the top of the embrasure, struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet. Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did so, we heard Mr. Morris' voice without. Sorry, I fear I have alarmed you. I shall come in and tell you about it. A minute later, he came in and said, It was an idiotic thing of me to do, and I ask your pardon, Mrs. Harker, most sincerely. I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is that whilst the professor was talking, there came a big bat and sat on the window sill. I have got such a horror of the damned brutes from recent events that I cannot stand them, and I went out to have a shot, as I have been doing late of evenings, whenever I have seen one. You used to laugh at me for it then, Art. Did you hit it? asked Dr. Van Helsing. I don't know. I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood. Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. We must trace each of these boxes, and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair, or we must, so to speak, sterilise the earth, so that no more he can seek safely in it. Thus, in the end, we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset, and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. And now for you, Madam Mina, this night is end until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such risk. When we part tonight, you no more must question. We are men and are able to bear, but you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in danger, such as we are. All the men, even Jonathan, seemed relieved, but it did not seem to me good that they should brave danger and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety through care of me. But their minds were made up, and though it was a bitter pill for me to swallow, I could say nothing, save to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. As there is no time to lose, I vote we have a look at his house right now. Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim. I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close, but I did not say anything, for I had a greater fear that if I appeared as a drag or a hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of their councils altogether. They have now gone off to Carfax, with means to get into the house. Manlike, they had told me to go to bed and sleep, as if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger. I shall lie down and pretend to sleep, lest Jonathan have added anxiety about me when he returns. Dr. Seward's Diary, 1st of October, 4am. 
Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say that I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, "'He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. I don't know but what, if you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits.' I knew the man would not have said this without some cause, so I said, "'All right, I'll go now,' and I asked the others to wait a few minutes for me, as I had to go and see my patient. "'Take me with you, friends John,' said the professor. "'His case in your diary interests me much, and it had bearing, too, now and again, on our case. I should much like to see him, and especially when his mind is disturbed.' "'May I come along also?' asked Lord Godalming. "'Me too,' said Quincy Morris. "'May I come?' said Harker. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I had ever seen in a lunatic, and he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail, with others entirely sane. We all five went into the room, but none of the others at first said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. This he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery, and deducing his own existing sanity. "'I appeal to your friends,' he said. "'They will perhaps not mind sitting in judgment on my case. "'By the way, you have not introduced me.' I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum did not strike me at the moment, and besides, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner, so much of the habit of equality, that I at once made the introduction. "'Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing, Mr Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr Jonathan Harker, Mr Renfield. He shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming, I had the honour of seconding your father at the Wyndham. I grieve to know, by your holding the title, that he is no more. He was a man loved and honoured by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of a burnt rum punch, much patronised on Derby night. Mr Morris, you should be proud of your great state. Its reception into the Union was a precedent which may have far-reaching effects hereafter, when the Pole and the Tropics may hold alliance for the Stars and Stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement, when the Monroe Doctrine takes its true place in the political fable. What shall any man say of his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionised therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You, gentlemen, who by nationality, by heredity, or by the possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world, I take to witness that I am sane, as at least the majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties. And I am sure that you, Dr. Seward, humanitarian and medico-jurist, as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered as under exceptional circumstances. He made this last appeal with a courtly air of conviction which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered. For my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored, and I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity, and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I thought it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement, for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes. This did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, "'But I fear, Dr. Seward, that you hardly apprehend my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. Time presses, and in our implied agreement with the old scytheman it is of the essence of the contract.' I am sure it is only necessary to put before so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward so simple, yet so momentous a wish, to ensure its fulfilment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing the negative in my face, turned to the others, and scrutinised them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on. Is it possible I have erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly, but at the same time, as I felt, brutally. There was a considerable pause, and then he said slowly, then I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession, 
boon, privilege, whatever you will. I am content to implore in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones, unsound and unselfish, and spring from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, sir, into my heart, you would approve to the full the sentiments which animate me. Nay, more, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friends. Again he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another phase of his madness, and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of utmost intensity, his bushy eyebrows almost meeting with the fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as of one addressing an equal, "'Can you not tell frankly your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that if you will satisfy even me, a stranger without prejudice, and with a habit of keeping an open mind, Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk and his own responsibility, the privilege you seek. He shook his head sadly, and with a look of poignant regret on his face, the professor went on. Come, sir, bethink yourself. You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree, since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. If you will not help us in our effort to choose the wisest course, how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? Be wise and help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He still shook his head as he said, Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete, and if I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment, but I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave, so I went towards the door, simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door, a new change came over the patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared he was about to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless, for he held up his two hands imploringly and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotion was mitigating against him, by storing us more to our old relations, he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes, so it became a little more fixed in my manner if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. I had previously seen something of the same constantly growing excitement in him when he had to make some request of which at the time he had thought much, such, for instance, as when he wanted a cat, and I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. My expectation was not realised, for when he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on to his knees and held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication, and poured forth a torrent of entreaty, with the tears rolling down his cheeks, and his whole face and form expressive of the deepest emotion. "'Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward. Oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Send me away, how you will, and where you will. Send keepers with me, with whips and chains. Let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacled and leg-ironed, even to jail. But let me go out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I'm speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. You don't know whom you wrong, or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me, I may not tell. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, by your love that is lost, by your hope that lives, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that I am sane and earnest now? That I am no lunatic in a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul? Oh, hear me! Hear me! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit. So I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly. No more of this. We have had quite enough already. Get to your bed and tried to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intently for several moments. Then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasions, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, last of our party, he said to me in a quiet, well-bred voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, 
do me the justice to bear in mind later on that I did what I could to convince you tonight. End of chapter 18